introduction to rights of man by thomas paine read from the writings of thomas paine volume two collected and edited by moncure daniel conway this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana rights of man editor's introduction when thomas paine sailed from america for france in april seventeen eighty seven he was perhaps as happy a man as any in the world his most intimate friend thomas jefferson was minister at paris and his friend lafayette was the idol of france his fame had preceded him and he at once became in paris the centre of the same circle of savants and philosophers that had surrounded benjamin franklin his main reason for proceeding at once to paris was that he might submit to the academy of sciences his invention of an iron bridge and with its favourable verdict he came to england in september he at once went to his aged mother at thetford leaving with a publisher ridgeway his prospects on the rubicon he next made arrangements to patent his bridge and to construct at rotherham the large model of it exhibited on paddington green london he was welcomed in england by leading statesmen such as lansdowne and fox and above all by edmund burke who for some time had him as a guest at beaconsfield and drove him about in various parts of the country he had not the slightest revolutionary purpose either as regarded england or france towards louis the sixteenth he felt only gratitude for the services he had rendered america and towards george the third he felt no animosity whatever his four months sojourn in paris had convinced him that there was approaching a reform of that country after the american model except that the crown would be preserved a compromise he approved provided the throne should not be hereditary events in france travelled more swiftly than he had anticipated and paine was summoned by lafayette condorcet and others as an adviser in the formation of a new constitution such was the situation immediately preceding the political and literary duel between paine and burke which in the event turned out a tremendous war between royalism and republicanism in europe paine was both in france and in england the inspirer of moderate councils samuel rogers relates that in early life he dined at a friend's house in london with thomas paine when one of the toasts given was the memory of joshua in allusion to the hebrew leader's conquest of the kings of canaan and execution of them paine observed that he would not treat kings like joshua i'm of the scotch parson's opinion he said when he prayed against louis the fourteenth lord shake him over the mouth of hell but don't let him drop paine then gave as his toast quote, the republic of the world end quote, which samuel rogers aged twenty-nine noted as a sublime idea this was paine's faith and hope and with it he confronted the revolutionary storms which presently burst over france and england until burke's arraignment of france in his parliamentary speech february ninth seventeen ninety paine had no doubt whatever that he would sympathize with the movement in france and wrote to him from that country as if conveying glad tidings burke's reflections on the revolution in france appeared november first seventeen ninety and Paine at once set himself to answer it. He was then staying at the Angel Inn, Islington. The inn has been twice rebuilt since that time, and from its contents there is preserved only a small image, which perhaps was meant to represent liberty, possibly brought from Paris by Paine as an ornament for his study. From the Angel he removed to a house in Harding Street, Fetter Lane rickman says part first of rights of man was finished at versailles but probably this has reference to the preface only as i cannot find pain in france that year until april eighth the book had been printed by johnson in time for the opening of parliament in february but this publisher became frightened after a few copies were out there is one in the british museum and the work was transferred to j s jordan one sixty six fleet street with a preface sent from paris 
not contained in johnson's edition nor in the american editions the pamphlet though sold at the same price as burke's three shillings had a vast circulation and paine gave the proceeds to the constitutional societies which sprang up under his teachings in various parts of the country soon after appeared burke's appeal from the new to the old whigs in this burke quoted a good deal from rights of man but replied to it only with exclamation points saying that the only answer to such ideas merited was quote, criminal justice end quote Payne's Part Second followed, published February 17, 1792. In Part First, Payne had mentioned a rumor that Burke was a masked pensioner, a charge that will be noticed in connection with its detailed statement in a further publication. And as Burke had been formally arraigned in Parliament while paymaster for a very questionable proceeding, this charge no doubt hurt a good deal although the government did not follow burke's suggestion of a prosecution at that time there is little doubt that it was he who induced the prosecution of part second before the trial came on december eighteenth seventeen ninety two payne was occupying his seat in the french convention and could only be outlawed burke humorously remarked to a friend of payne and himself quote, we hunt in pairs End quote the severally representative character and influence of these two men in the revolutionary era in france and england deserve more adequate study than they have received while Payne maintained freedom of discussion burke first proposed criminal prosecution for sentiments by no means libelous such as Payne's part first while Payne was endeavoring to make the movement in france peaceful burke fomented the league of monarchs against france which maddened its people and brought on the reign of terror while Payne was endeavoring to preserve the french throne phantom though he believed it to prevent bloodshed burke was secretly writing to the queen of france entreating her not to compromise and to quote trust to the support of foreign armies end quote histoire de france depuis seventeen eighty nine henri martin i one fifty one while burke thus helped to bring the king and queen to the guillotine Payne pleaded for their lives to the last moment while Payne maintained the right of mankind to improve their condition burke held that quote, the awful author of our being is the author of our place in the order of existence and that having disposed and marshaled us by a divine tactic not according to our will but according to his he has in and by that disposition virtually subjected us to act the part which belongs to the place assigned us end quote Payne was a religious believer in eternal principles. Burke held that, quote, political problems do not primarily concern truth or falsehood. They relate to good or evil. What in the result is likely to produce evil is politically false. That which is productive of good politically is true, end quote. Assuming thus the visionary's right to decide before the result what was, quote, likely to produce evil, end quote, Burke vigorously sought to kindle war against the French Republic, which might have developed itself peacefully, while Payne was striving for an international congress in Europe in the interest of peace. Payne had faith in the people, and believed that if allowed to choose representatives, they would select their best and wisest men, and that while reforming government, the people would remain orderly, as they had generally remained in America during the transition from British rule to self-government. Burke maintained that if the existing political order were broken up, there would be no longer a people, but, quote, a number of vague, loose individuals, and nothing more, end quote alas he exclaims they little know how many a weary step is to be taken before they can form themselves into a mass which has a true personality for the sake of peace Payne wished the revolution to be peaceful as the advance of summer he used every endeavor to reconcile english radicals to some modus vivendi with the existing order as he was willing to retain louis the sixteenth as head of the executive in france burke resisted every tendency of english statesmanship to reform at home or to negotiate with the french republic and was mainly responsible for the king's death and the war that followed between england and france in february seventeen ninety three burke became a royal favorite Payne was outlawed by a prosecution originally proposed by Burke. 
while paine was demanding religious liberty burke was opposing the removal of penal statutes from unitarians on the ground that but for those statutes paine might some day set up a church in england when burke was retiring on a large royal pension paine was in prison through the devices of burke's confederate the american minister in paris so the two men as burke said quote, hunted in pairs so far as burke's attempts to affirm any principle he is fairly quoted in paine's work and nowhere misrepresented as for paine's own ideas the reader should remember that rights of man was the earliest complete statement of republican principles they were pronounced to be the fundamental principles of the american republic by jefferson madison and jackson the three presidents who above all others represented the republican idea which paine first allied with american independence those who suppose that Paine did but reproduce the principles of Rousseau and Locke will find by careful study of his well-weighed language that such is not the case. Paine's political principles were evolved out of his early Quakerism. He was potential in George Fox. The belief that every human soul was the child of God and capable of direct inspiration from the Father of all, without mediator or priestly intervention or sacramental instrumentality, was fatal to all privilege and rank. The universal fatherhood implied universal brotherhood or human equality but the fate of the quakers proved the necessity of protecting the individual spirit from oppression by the majority as well as by privileged classes for this purpose paine insisted on surrounding the individual right with the security of the declaration of rights not to be invaded by any government and would reduce government to an association limited in its operations to the defense of those rights which the individual is unable alone to maintain from the preceding chapter it will be seen that part second of rights of man was begun by paine in the spring of seventeen ninety one at the close of that year or early in seventeen ninety two he took up his abode with his friend thomas cleo rickman at number seven upper marillabone street rickman was a radical publisher the house remains still a bookbinding establishment and seems little changed since paine therein revised the proofs of part second on a table which rickman marked with a plate and which is now in possession of mr edward truelove as the plate states paine wrote on the same table other works which appeared in england in seventeen ninety two in seventeen ninety five d i eaton published an edition of rights of man with a preface purported to have been written by paine while in luxembourg prison it is manifestly spurious the genuine english and french prefaces are given end of introduction section one of rights of man by thomas paine this librivox recording is in the public domain Recorded by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rights of a Man Being an Answer to Mr. Burke's Attack on the French Revolution by Thomas Paine, Secretary for Foreign Affairs to Congress in the American War, and author of the works entitled Common Sense and A Letter to Abbe Raynal. Dedication George Washington, President of the United States of America sir i present you a small treatise in defense of those principles of freedom which your exemplary virtue hath so eminently contributed to establish that the rights of man may become as universal as your benevolence can wish and that you may enjoy the happiness of seeing the new world regenerate the old is the prayer of sir your much obliged and obedient humble servant thomas paine End of section. Section 2 of Rights of Man by Thomas Paine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rights of Man Being an Answer to Mr. Burke's Attack on the French Revolution. Paine's Preface to the English Edition. From the part Mr. Burke took in the American Revolution, it was natural that I should consider him a friend to mankind, and as our acquaintance commenced on that ground, it would have been more agreeable to me to have had cause to continue in that opinion than to change it. 
at the time mr burke made his violent speech last winter in the english parliament against the french revolution and the national assembly i was in paris and had written to him but a short time before to inform him how prosperously matters were going on soon after that i saw his advertisement of the pamphlet he intended to publish as the attack was to be made in a language but little studied and less understood in france and as everything suffers by translation i promised some of the friends of the revolution in that country that whenever mr burke's pamphlet came forth i would answer it this appeared to me the more necessary to be done when i saw the flagrant misrepresentations which mr burke's pamphlet contains and that while it is an outrageous abuse on the french revolution and the principles of liberty it is an imposition on the rest of the world i am the more astonished and disappointed at this conduct in mr burke as from the circumstances i am going to mention i had formed other expectations i had seen enough of the miseries of war to wish it might never more have existence in the world and that some other mode might be found out to settle the differences that should occasionally arise in the neighborhood of nations this certainly might be done if courts were disposed to set honesty about it or if countries were enlightened enough not to be made the dupes of courts the people of america had been bred up in the same prejudices against france which at that time characterized the people of england but experience and an acquaintance with the french nation have most effectually shown to the americans the falsehood of those prejudices and i do not believe that a more cordial and confidential intercourse exists between any two countries than between america and france when i came to france in the spring of seventeen eighty seven the archbishop of toulouse was then minister and at that time highly esteemed i became much acquainted with the private secretary of that minister a man of an enlarged benevolent heart and found that his sentiments and my own perfectly agreed with respect to the madness of war and the wretched impolicy of two nations like england and france continually worrying each other to no other end than that of a mutual increase of burdens and taxes that i might be assured i had not misunderstood him nor he me i put the substance of our opinions into writing and sent it to him subjoining a request that if i should see among the people of england any disposition to cultivate a better understanding between the two nations than had hitherto prevailed how far i might be authorized to say that the same disposition prevailed on the part of france he answered me by letter in the most unreserved manner and that not for himself only but for the minister with whose knowledge the letter was declared to be written i put this letter into the hands of mr burke almost three years ago and left it with him where it still remains hoping and at the same time naturally expecting from the opinion i had conceived of him that he would find some opportunity of making good use of it for the purpose of removing those errors and prejudices which two neighboring nations from the want of knowing each other had entertained to the injury of both when the french revolution broke out it certainly afforded to mr burke an opportunity of doing some good had he been disposed to it instead of which no sooner did he see the old prejudices wearing away than he immediately began sowing the seeds of a new inveteracy as if he were afraid that england and france would cease to be enemies that there are men in all countries who get their living by war and by keeping up the quarrels of nations is as shocking as it is true but when those who are concerned in the government of a country make it their study to sow discord and cultivate prejudices between nations it becomes the more unpardonable with respect to a paragraph in this work alluding to mr burke's having a pension the report has been some time in circulation at least two months and as a person is often the last to hear what concerns him the most to know i have mentioned it that mr burke may have an opportunity of contradicting the rumor if he thinks proper thomas paine end of section two Section 3 of Rights of Man by Thomas Paine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rights of Man being an answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French Revolution. 
Paine's Preface to the French Edition the astonishment which the french revolution has caused throughout europe should be considered from two different points of view first as it affects foreign peoples secondly as it affects their governments the cause of the french people is that of all europe or rather of the whole world but the governments of all those countries are by no means favorable to it it is important that we should never lose sight of this distinction we must not confuse the peoples with their governments especially not the english people with its government the government of england is no friend of the revolution of france of this we have sufficient proofs in the thanks given by that weak and witless person the elector of hanover sometimes called the king of england to mr burke for the insults heaped on it in his book and in the malevolent comments of the english minister pitt in his speeches in parliament in spite of the professions of sincerest friendship found in the official correspondence of the english government with that of france its conduct gives the lie to all its declarations and shows us clearly that it is not a court to be trusted but an insane court plunging in all the quarrels and intrigues of europe in quest of a war to satisfy its folly and countenance its extravagance the english nation on the contrary is very favorably disposed towards the french revolution and to the progress of liberty in the whole world and this feeling will become more general in england as the intrigues and artifices of its government are better known and the principles of the revolution better understood the french should know that most english newspapers are directly in the pay of government or if indirectly connected with it always under its orders and that those papers constantly distort and attack the revolution in france in order to deceive the nation but as it is impossible long to prevent the prevalence of truth the daily falsehoods of those papers no longer have the desired effect to be convinced that the voice of truth has been stifled in england the world needs only to be told that the government regards and prosecutes as a libel that which it should protect this outrage on morality is called law and judges are found wicked enough to inflict penalties on truth the english government presents just now a curious phenomenon seeing that the french and english nations are getting rid of the prejudices and false notions formerly entertained against each other and which have cost them so much money that government seems to be placarding its need of a foe for unless it finds one somewhere no pretext exists for the enormous revenue and taxation now deemed necessary therefore it seeks in russia the enemy it has lost in france and appears to say to the universe or to say to itself quote, if nobody will be so kind as to become my foe i shall need no more fleets nor armies and shall be forced to reduce my taxes the american war enabled me to double the taxes the dutch business to add more the nootka humbug gave me a pretext for raising three millions sterling more but unless i can make an enemy of russia the harvest from wars will end i was the first to incite turk against russian and now i hope to reap a fresh crop of taxes End quote if the miseries of war and the flood of evils it spreads over the country did not check all inclination to mirth and turn laughter into grief the frantic conduct of the government of england would only excite ridicule but it is impossible to banish from one's mind the images of suffering which the contemplation of such vicious policy presents to reason with governments as they have existed for ages is to argue with brutes it is only from the nations themselves that reforms can be expected there ought not now to exist any doubt that the peoples of france england and america enlightened and enlightening each other shall henceforth be able not merely to give the world an example of good government but by their united influence enforce its practice translated from the french end of section three Section 4 of Rights of Man by Thomas Paine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rights of Man, Part the First, being an answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French Revolution. Part 1 of 13. 
among the incivilities by which nations or individuals provoke and irritate each other mr burke's pamphlet on the french revolution is an extraordinary instance neither the people of france nor the national assembly were troubling themselves about the affairs of england or the english parliament and that mr burke should commence an unprovoked attack upon them both in parliament and in public is a conduct that cannot be pardoned on the score of manners nor justified on that of policy there is scarcely an epithet of abuse to be found in the english language with which mr burke has not loaded the french nation and the national assembly everything which rancor prejudice ignorance or knowledge could suggest is poured forth in the copious fury of near four hundred pages in the strain and on the plan mr burke was writing he might have written on as many thousands when the tongue or the pen is let loose in a frenzy of passion it is the man and not the subject that becomes exhausted hitherto mr burke has been mistaken and disappointed in the opinions he has formed of the affairs of france but such is the ingenuity of his hope or the malignancy of his despair that it furnishes him with new pretenses to go on there was a time when it was impossible to make mr burke believe that there would be any revolution in france his opinion was then that the french had neither spirit to undertake it nor fortitude to support it and now that there is one he seeks an escape by condemning it not sufficiently content with abusing the national assembly a great part of his work is taken up with abusing dr pierce one of the best-hearted men that lives and the two societies in england known by the name of the revolution society and the society for constitutional information dr price had preached a sermon on the fourth of november seventeen eighty nine being the anniversary of what is called in england the revolution which took place sixteen eighty eight mr burke speaking of this sermon says quote, the political divine proceeds dogmatically to assert that by the principles of the revolution the people of england have acquired three fundamental rights one to choose our own governors two to cashier them for misconduct three to frame a government for ourselves End quote. dr price does not say that the right to do these things exists in this or in that person or in this or in that description of persons but that it exists in the whole that it is a right resident in the nation mr burke on the contrary denies that such a right exists in the nation either in whole or in part or that it exists anywhere and what is still more strange and marvellous he says quote, that the people of england utterly disclaim such a right and that they will resist the practical assertion of it with their lives and fortunes End quote. that men should take up arms and spend their lives and fortune not to maintain their rights but to maintain they have not rights is an entirely new species of discovery and suited to the paradoxical genius of mr burke the method which mr burke takes to prove that the people of england have no such rights and that such rights do not now exist in the nation either in whole or in part or anywhere at all is of the same marvellous and monstrous kind with what he has already said for his arguments are that the persons or the generations of persons in whom they did exist are dead and with them the right is dead also to prove this he quotes a declaration made by parliament about a hundred years ago to william and mary in these words quote, the lords spiritual and temporal and commons do in the name of the people aforesaid meaning the people of england then living most humbly and faithfully submit themselves their heirs and posterities for ever he quotes a clause of another act of parliament made in the same reign the terms of which he says quote, bind us meaning the people of their day our heirs and our posterity to them their heirs and posterity to the end of time end quote. mr burke conceives his point sufficiently established by producing those clauses which he enforces by saying that they exclude the right of the nation for ever and not yet content with making such declarations repeated over and over again he farther states 
unquote, that if the people of england possessed such a right before the revolution which he acknowledges to have been the case not only in england but throughout europe at an early period yet that the english nation did at the time of the revolution most solemnly renounce and abdicate it for themselves and for all their posterity forever End quote. As Mr. Burke occasionally applies the poison drawn from his horrid principles not only to the English nation, but to the French Revolution and the National Assembly, and charges that august, illuminated, and illuminating body of men with the epithet of usurpers, I shall, sans ceremony, place another system of principles in opposition to his. The English Parliament of 1688 did a certain thing, which for themselves and their constituents they had a right to do, and which it appeared right should be done. But in addition to this right, which they possessed by delegation, they set up another right by assumption, that of binding and controlling posterity to the end of time. The case, therefore, divides itself into two parts, the right which they possessed by delegation, and the right which they set up by assumption. The first is admitted, but with respect to the second, I reply, there never did, there never will, and there never can exist a parliament, or any description of men, or any generation of men, in any country, possessed of the right or the power of binding and controlling posterity to the end of time, or of commanding forever how the world shall be governed, or who shall govern it, and therefore all such clauses acts or declarations by which the makers of them attempt to do what they have neither the right nor the power to do nor the power to execute are in themselves null and void every age and generation must be as free to act for itself in all cases as the age and generations which preceded it the vanity and presumption of governing beyond the grave is the most ridiculous and insolent of all tyrannies man has no property in man neither has any generation a property in the generations which are to follow the parliament or the people of sixteen eighty eight or of any other period had no more right to dispose of the people of the present day or to bind or to control them in any shape whatever than the parliament or the people of the present day have to dispose of bind or control those who are to live a hundred or a thousand years hence every generation is and must be competent to all the purposes which its occasions require it is the living and not the dead that are to be accommodated when man ceases to be his power and his wants cease with him and having no longer any participation in the concerns of this world he has no longer any authority in directing who shall be its governors or how its government shall be organized or how administered i am not contending for nor against any form of government nor for nor against any party here or elsewhere that which a whole nation chooses to do it has a right to do mr burke says no where then does the right exist i am contending for the rights of the living and against their being willed away and controlled and contracted for by the manuscript assumed authority of the dead and mr burke is contending for the authority of the dead over the rights and freedom of the living there was a time when kings disposed of their crowns by will upon their deathbeds and consigned the people like beasts of the field to whatever successor they appointed this is now so exploded as scarcely to be remembered and so monstrous as hardly to be believed but the parliamentary clauses upon which mr burke builds his political church are of the same nature the laws of every country must be analogous to some common principle in england no parent or master nor all the authority of parliament omnipotent as it has called itself can bind or control the personal freedom even of an individual beyond the age of twenty-one years on what ground of right then could the parliament of sixteen eighty eight or any other parliament bind all posterity for ever those who have quitted the world and those who have not yet arrived at it are as remote from each other as the utmost stretch of mortal imagination can conceive what possible obligation then can exist between them 
what rule or principle can be laid down that of two non-entities the one out of existence and the one not in and who can never meet in this world the one should control the other to the end of time in england it is said that money cannot be taken out of the pockets of the people without their consent but who authorized or who could authorize the parliament of sixteen eighty eight to control and take away the freedom of posterity who were not in existence to give or to withhold their consent and limit and confine their right of acting in certain cases for ever a greater absurdity cannot present itself to the understanding of man than what mr burke offers to his readers he tells them and he tells the world to come that a certain body of men who existed a hundred years ago made a law and that there does not exist in the nation nor ever will nor ever can a power to alter it under how many subtleties or absurdities has the divine right to govern been imposed on the credulity of mankind mr burke has discovered a new one and he has shortened his journey to rome by appealing to the power of this infallible parliament of former days and he produces what it has done as of divine authority for that power must certainly be more than human which no human power to the end of time can alter but mr burke has done some service not to his cause but to his country by bringing those clauses into public view they serve to demonstrate how necessary it is at all times to watch against the attempted encroachment of power and to prevent its running to excess it is somewhat extraordinary that the offence for which james the second was expelled that of setting up power by assumption should be reacted under another shape and form by the parliament that expelled him it shows that the rights of man were but imperfectly understood at the revolution for certain it is that the right which that parliament set up by assumption for by the delegation it had not and could not have because none could give it over the persons and freedom of posterity for ever was of the same tyrannical unfounded kind which james attempted to set up over parliament and the nation and for which he was expelled the only difference is for in principle they differ not that the one was an usurper over living and the other over the unborn and as the one has no better authority to stand upon than the other both of them must be equally null and void and of no effect from what or from whence does mr burke prove the right of any human power to bind posterity for ever he has produced his clauses but he must produce also his proofs that such a right existed and show how it existed if it ever existed it must now exist for whatever appertains to the nature of man cannot be annihilated by man it is the nature of man to die and he will continue to die as long as he continues to be born but mr burke has set up a sort of political adam in whom all posterity are bound for ever he must therefore prove that his adam possessed such a power or such a right the weaker any cord is the less it will bear to be stretched and the worst is the policy to stretch it unless it is intended to break it had any one proposed the overthrow of mr burke's positions he would have proceeded as mr burke has done he would have magnified the authorities on purpose to have called the right of them into question and the instant the question of right was started the authorities must have been given up it requires but a very small glance of thought to perceive that although laws made in one generation often continue in force through succeeding generations yet they continue to derive their force from the consent of the living a law not repealed continues in force not because it cannot be repealed but because it is not repealed and the non-repealing passes for consent but mr burke's clauses have not even this qualification in their favor they become null by attempting to become immortal the nature of them precludes consent they destroy the right which they might have by grounding it on a right which they cannot have immortal power is not a human right and therefore cannot be a right of parliament 
the parliament of 1688 might as well have passed an act to have authorized themselves to live forever as to make their authority live forever all therefore that can be said of those clauses is that they are a formality of words of as much import as if those who used them had addressed a congratulation to themselves and in the oriental style of antiquity had said o oh, parliament live for ever the circumstances of the world are continually changing and the opinions of men change also and as government is for the living not for the dead it is the living only that has any right in it that which may be thought right and found convenient in one age may be thought wrong and found inconvenient in another in such cases who is to decide the living or the dead as almost one hundred pages of mr burke's book are employed upon these clauses it will consequently follow that if the clauses themselves so far as they set up an assumed usurped dominion over posterity for ever are unauthoritative and in their nature null and void that all his voluminous inferences and declamation drawn therefrom or founded thereon are null and void also and on this ground i rest the matter end of part one of thirteen section five of rights of man by thomas paine this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana rights of man part the first being an answer to mr burke's attack on the french revolution part two of thirteen we come now more particularly to the affairs of france mr burke's book has the appearance of being written as instruction to the french nation but if i may permit myself the use of an extravagant metaphor suited to the extravagance of the case it is darkness attempting to illuminate light while i am writing this there are accidentally before me some proposals for a declaration of rights by the marquis de lafayette i ask his pardon for using his former address and do it only for distinction's sake to the national assembly on the eleventh of july seventeen eighty nine three days before the taking of the bastille and i cannot but remark with astonishment how opposite the sources are from which that gentleman and mr burke draw their principles instead of referring to musty records and mouldy parchments to prove that the rights of the living are lost Quote, renounced and abdicated for ever by those who are now no more as mr burke has done m de lafayette applies to the living world and emphatically says quote, call to mind the sentiments which nature has engraved on the heart of every citizen and which take a new force when they are solemnly recognized by all for a nation to love liberty it is sufficient that she knows it and to be free it is sufficient that she wills it End quote. how dry barren and obscure is the source from which mr burke labors and how ineffectual though gay with flowers are all his declamation and his arguments compared with these clear concise and soul animating sentiments few and short as they are they lead on to a vast field of generous and manly thinking and do not finish like mr burke's periods with music in the ear and nothing in the heart as i have introduced m de lafayette i will take the liberty of adding an anecdote respecting his farewell address to the congress of america in seventeen eighty three and which occurred fresh to my mind when i saw mr burke's thundering attack on the french revolution m de lafayette went to america at the early period of the war and continued a volunteer in her service to the end his conduct through the whole of that enterprise is one of the most extraordinary that is to be found in the history of a young man scarcely twenty years of age situated in a country that was like the lap of sensual pleasure and with the means of enjoying it how few are there to be found who would exchange such a scene for the woods and wilderness of america and pass the flowery years of youth in unprofitable danger and hardship but such is the fact when the war ended and he was on the point of taking his final departure he presented himself to congress and contemplating in his affectionate farewell the revolution he had seen expressed himself in these words 
quote, may this great monument raised to liberty serve as a lesson to the oppressor and an example to the oppressed End quote. when this address came to the hands of dr franklin who was then in france he applied to count vergennes to have it inserted in the french gazette but never could obtain his consent the fact was that count vergennes was an aristocratical despot at home and dreaded the example of the american revolution in france as certain other persons now dread the example of the french revolution in england and mr burke's tribute of fear for in this light his book must be considered runs parallel with count vergennes refusal but to return more particularly to his work quote, we have seen says mr burke the french rebel against a mild and lawful monarch with more fury outrage and insult than any people has been known to rise against the most illegal usurper or the most sanguinary tyrant End quote. this is one among a thousand other instances in which mr burke shows that he is ignorant of the springs and principles of the french revolution it was not against louis the sixteenth but against the despotic principles of the government that the nation revolted these principles had not their origin in him but in the original establishment many centuries back and they were become too deeply rooted to be removed and the augean stables of parasites and plunderers too abominably filthy to be cleansed by anything short of a complete and universal revolution when it becomes necessary to do anything the whole heart and soul should go into the measure or not attempt it that crisis was then arrived and there remained no choice but to act with determined vigor or not to act at all the king was known to be the friend of the nation and this circumstance was favorable to the enterprise perhaps no man bred up in the style of an absolute king ever possessed a heart so little disposed to the exercise of that species of power as the present king of france but the principles of the government itself still remained the same the monarch and the monarchy were distinct and separate things and it was against the established despotism of the latter and not against the person or principles of the former that the revolt commenced and the revolution has been carried mr burke does not attend to the distinction between men and principles and therefore does not see that a revolt may take place against the despotism of the latter while there lies no charge of despotism against the former the natural moderation of louis the sixteenth contributed nothing to alter the hereditary despotism of the monarchy all the tyrannies of former reigns acted under that hereditary despotism were still liable to be revived in the hands of a successor it was not the respite of a reign that would satisfy france enlightened as she was then become a casual discontinuance of the practice of despotism is not a discontinuance of its principles the former depends on the virtue of the individual who is in immediate possession of the power the latter on the virtue and fortitude of the nation in the case of charles i and james the second of england the revolt was against the personal despotism of the men whereas in france it was against the hereditary despotism of the established government but men who can consign over the rights of posterity forever on the authority of a mouldy parchment like mr burke are not qualified to judge of this revolution it takes in a field too vast for their views to explore and proceeds with a mightiness of reason they cannot keep pace with but there are many points of view in which this revolution may be considered when despotism has established itself for ages in a country as in france it is not in the person of the king only that it resides it has the appearance of being so in show and in nominal authority but it is not so in practice and in fact it has its standard everywhere every office and department has its despotism founded upon custom and usage every place has its bastille and every bastille its despot the original hereditary despotism resident in the person of the king divides and subdivides itself into a thousand shapes and forms till at last the whole of it is acted by deputation this was the case in france and against this species of despotism proceeding on through an endless labyrinth of office till the source of it is scarcely perceptible there is no mode of redress 
it strengthens itself by assuming the appearance of duty and tyrannies under the pretense of obeying when a man reflects on the condition which france was in from the nature of her government he will see other causes for revolt than those which immediately connect themselves with the person or character of louis the sixteenth there were if i may so express it a thousand despotisms to be reformed in france which had grown up under the hereditary despotism of the monarchy and became so rooted as to be in a great measure independent of it between the monarchy the parliament and the church there was a rivalship of despotism besides the feudal despotism operating locally and the ministerial despotism operating everywhere but mr burke by considering the king as the only possible object of a revolt speaks as if france was a village in which everything that passed must be known to its commanding officer and no oppression could be acted but what he could immediately control mr burke might have been in the bastille his whole life as well under louis the sixteenth as under louis the fourteenth and neither the one nor the other have known that such a man as burke existed the despotic principles of the government were the same in both reigns though the dispositions of the men were as remote as tyranny and benevolence what mr burke considers as a reproach to the french revolution that of bringing it forward under a reign more mild than the preceding ones is one of its highest honors the revolutions that have taken place in other european countries have been excited by personal hatred the rage was against the man and he became the victim but in the instance of france we see a revolution generated in the rational contemplation of the rights of man and distinguishing from the beginning between persons and principles but mr burke appears to have no idea of principles when he is contemplating governments Quote, ten years ago says he i could have felicitated france on her having a government without inquiring what the nature of that government was or how it was administered End quote. is this the language of a rational man is it the language of a heart feeling as it ought to feel for the rights and happiness of the human race on this ground mr burke must compliment all the governments in the world while the victims who suffer under them whether sold into slavery or tortured out of existence are wholly forgotten it is power and not principles that mr burke venerates and under this abominable depravity he is disqualified to judge between them thus much for his opinion as to the occasions of the french revolution i now proceed to other considerations i know a place in america called point no point because as you proceed along the shore gay and flowery as mr burke's language it continually recedes and presents itself at a distance before you but when you have got as far as you can go there is no point at all just thus it is with mr burke's three hundred and sixty-six pages it is therefore difficult to reply to him but as the points he wishes to establish may be inferred from what he abuses it is in his paradoxes that we must look for his arguments as to the tragic paintings by which mr burke has outraged his own imagination and seeks to work upon that of his readers they are very well calculated for theatrical representation where facts are manufactured for the sake of show and accommodated to produce through the weakness of sympathy a weeping effect but mr burke should recollect that he is writing history and not plays and that his readers will expect truth and not the spouting rant of high-toned exclamation when we see a man dramatically lamenting in a publication intended to be believed that quote, the age of chivalry is gone that the glory of europe is extinguished for ever that the unbought grace of life if anyone knows what that is the cheap defense of nations the nurse of manly sentiment and heroic enterprise is gone end quote. and all this because the quixote age of chivalry nonsense is gone what opinion can we form of his judgment or what regard can we pay to his facts in the rhapsody of his imagination he has discovered a world of windmills and his sorrows are that there are no quixots to attack them but if the age of aristocracy like that of chivalry should fall and they had originally some connection mr burke the trumpeter of the order may continue his parody to the end and finish with exclaiming quote, othello's occupation's gone End quote. 
notwithstanding mr burke's horrid paintings when the french revolution is compared with the revolutions of other countries the astonishment will be that it is marked with so few sacrifices but this astonishment will cease when we reflect that principles and not persons were the meditated objects of destruction the mind of the nation was acted upon by a higher stimulus than what the consideration of persons could inspire and sought a higher conquest than could be produced by the downfall of an enemy among the few who fell there did not appear to be any that were intentionally singled out they all of them had their fate in the circumstance of the moment and were not pursued with that long cold-blooded unabated revenge which pursued the unfortunate scotch in the affair of seventeen forty five through the whole of mr burke's book i do not observe that the bastille is mentioned more than once and that with a kind of implication as if he were sorry it was pulled down and wished it were built up again Quote, we have rebuilt newgate says he and tenanted the mansion and we have prisons almost as strong as the bastille for those who dare to libel the queens of france End quote as to what a madman like the person called lord george gordon might say and to whom newgate is rather a bedlam than a prison it is unworthy a rational consideration it was a madman that libelled and that is sufficient apology and it afforded an opportunity for confining him which was the thing that was wished for but certain as it is that mr burke who does not call himself a madman whatever other people may do has libelled in the most unprovoked manner and in the grossest style of the most vulgar abuse the whole representative authority of france and yet mr burke takes his seat in the british house of commons from his violence and his grief his silence on some points and his excess on others it is difficult not to believe that mr burke is sorry extremely sorry that arbitrary power the power of the pope and the bastille are pulled down not one glance of compassion not one commiserating reflection that i can find throughout his book has he bestowed on those who lingered out the most wretched of lives a life without hope in the most miserable of prisons it is painful to behold a man employing his talents to corrupt himself nature has been kinder to mr burke than he is to her he is not affected by the reality of distress touching his heart but by the showy resemblance of it striking his imagination he pities the plumage but forgets the dying bird accustomed to kiss the aristocratical hand that hath purloined him from himself he degenerates into a composition of art and the genuine soul of nature forsakes him his hero or his heroine must be a tragedy victim expiring in show and not the real prisoner of misery sliding into death in the silence of a dungeon as mr burke has passed over the whole transaction of the bastille and his silence is nothing in his favor and has entertained his readers with reflections on supposed facts distorted into real falsehoods i will give since he has not some account of the circumstances which preceded the transaction they will serve to show that less mischief could scarcely have accompanied such an event when considered with the treacherous and hostile aggravations of the enemies of the revolution End of part two of thirteen. Section six of Rights of Man by Thomas Paine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rights of Man, part the first, being an answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French Revolution. Part three of thirteen the mind can hardly picture to itself a more tremendous scene than what the city of paris exhibited at the time of taking the bastille and for two days before and after nor perceive the possibility of its quieting so soon at a distance this transaction has appeared only as an act of heroism standing on itself and the close political connection it had with the revolution is lost in the brilliancy of the achievement but we are to consider it as the strength of the parties brought man to man and contending for the issue the bastille was to be either the prize or the prison of the assailants the downfall of it included the idea of the downfall of despotism and this compounded image was become as figuratively united as bunyan's doubting castle and giant despair 
the national assembly before and at the time of taking the bastille was sitting at versailles twelve miles distant from paris about a week before the rising of the partisans and their taking the bastille it was discovered that a plot was forming at the head of which was the count d'artois the king's youngest brother for demolishing the national assembly seizing its members and thereby crushing by a coup de main all hopes and prospects of forming a free government for the sake of humanity as well as freedom it is well this plan did not succeed examples are not wanting to show how dreadfully vindictive and cruel are all old governments when they are successful against what they call a city and the revolt this plan must have been some time in contemplation because in order to carry it into execution it was necessary to collect a large military force around paris and cut off the communication between that city and the national assembly at versailles the troops destined for this service were chiefly the foreign troops in the pay of france and who for this particular purpose were drawn from the distant provinces where they were then stationed when they were collected to the amount of between twenty five and thirty thousand it was judged time to put the plan into execution the ministry who were then in office and who were friendly to the revolution were instantly dismissed and a new ministry formed of those who had concerted the project among whom was count de broglio and to his share was given the command of those troops the character of this man as described to me in a letter which i communicated to mr burke before he began to write his book and from mr burke well knows was good was that of quote, a high-flying aristocrat cool and capable of every mischief end quote. while these matters were agitating the national assembly stood in the most perilous and critical situation that a body of men can be supposed to act in they were the devoted victims and they knew it they had the hearts and wishes of their country on their side but military authority they had none the guards of broglio surrounded the hall where the assembly sat ready at the word of command to seize their persons as had been done the year before to the parliament of paris had the national assembly deserted their trust or had they exhibited signs of weakness or fear their enemies had been encouraged and their country depressed when the situation they stood in the cause they were engaged in and the crisis then ready to burst which should determine their personal and political fate and that of their country and probably of europe are taken into one view none but a heart callous with prejudice or corrupted by dependence can avoid interesting itself in their success the archbishop of vienne was at this time president of the national assembly a person too old to undergo the scene that a few days or a few hours might bring forth a man of more activity and bolder fortitude was necessary and the national assembly chose under the form of a vice-president for the presidency still resided in the archbishop monsieur de lafayette and this is the only instance of a vice-president being chosen it was at the moment that this storm was pending july eleventh that a declaration of rights was brought forward by m de lafayette and is the same which is alluded to earlier it was hastily drawn up and makes only a part of the more extensive declaration of rights agreed upon and adopted afterwards by the national assembly the particular reason for bringing it forward at this moment m de lafayette has since informed me was that if the national assembly should fall in the threatened destruction that then surrounded it some trace of its principles might have a chance of surviving the wreck everything now was drawing to a crisis the event was freedom or slavery on one side an army of nearly thirty thousand men on the other an unarmed body of citizens for the citizens of paris on whom the national assembly must then immediately depend were as unarmed and as undisciplined as the citizens of london are now the french guards had given strong symptoms of their being attached to the national cause but their numbers were small not a tenth part of the force that broglio commanded and their officers were in the interest of broglio matters being now ripe for execution the new ministry made their appearance in office the reader will carry in his mind that the bastille was taken on the fourteenth july the point of time i am now speaking of is the twelfth 
immediately on the news of the change of ministry reaching paris in the afternoon all the playhouses and places of entertainment shops and houses were shut up the change of ministry was considered as the prelude of hostilities and the opinion was rightly founded the foreign troops began to advance towards the city the prince of lambesque who commanded a body of german cavalry approached by the place of louis the fifteenth which connects itself with some of the streets in his march he insulted and struck an old man with a sword the french are remarkable for their respect to old age and the insolence with which it appeared to be done uniting with the general fermentation they were in produced a powerful effect and a cry of to arms to arms spread itself in a moment over the city arms they had none nor scarcely any one who knew the use of them but desperate resolution when every hope is at stake supplies for a while the want of arms near where the prince de lambesque was drawn up were large piles of stones collected for building the new bridge and with these the people attacked the cavalry a party of french guards upon hearing the firing rushed from their quarters and joined the people and night coming on the cavalry retreated the streets of paris being narrow are favorable for defence and the loftiness of the houses consisting of many stories from which great annoyance might be given secured them against nocturnal enterprises and the night was spent in providing themselves with every sort of weapon they could make or procure guns swords blacksmiths hammers carpenters axes iron crows pikes halberds pitchforks spits clubs etc etc the incredible numbers in which they assembled the next morning and the still more incredible resolution they exhibited embarrassed and astonished their enemies little did the new ministry expect such a salute accustomed to slavery themselves they had no idea that liberty was capable of such inspiration or that a body of unarmed citizens would dare to face the military force of thirty thousand men every moment of this day was employed in collecting arms concerting plans and arranging themselves into the best order which such an instantaneous movement could afford broglio continued lying round the city but made no further advances this day and the succeeding night passed with as much tranquillity as such a scene could possibly produce but defence only was not the object of the citizens they had a cause at stake on which depended their freedom or their slavery they every moment expected an attack or to hear of one made on the national assembly and in such a situation the most prompt measures are sometimes the best the object that now presented itself was the bastille and the eclat of carrying such a fortress in the face of such an army could not fail to strike terror into the new ministry who had scarcely yet had time to meet by some intercepted correspondence this morning it was discovered that the mayor of paris m de flesselles who appeared to be in the interest of the citizens was betraying them and from this discovery there remained no doubt that broglio would reinforce the bastille the ensuing evening it was therefore necessary to attack it that day but before this could be done it was first necessary to procure a better supply of arms than they were then possessed of there was adjoining to the city a large magazine of arms deposited at the hospital of the invalides which the citizens summoned to surrender and as the place was neither defensible nor attempted such defence they soon succeeded thus supplied they marched to attack the bastille a vast mixed multitude of all ages and of all degrees armed with all sorts of weapons imagination would fail in describing to itself the appearance of such a procession and of the anxiety of the events which a few hours or a few minutes might produce what plans the ministry were forming were as unknown to the people within the city as what the citizens were doing was unknown to the ministry and what movements broglio might make for the support or relief of the place were to the citizens equally as unknown all was mystery and hazard that the bastille was attacked with an enthusiasm of heroism such only as the highest animation of liberty could inspire and carried in the space of a few hours is an event which the world is fully possessed of i am not undertaking the detail of the attack but bringing into view the conspiracy against the nation which provoked it and which fell with the bastille 
the prison to which the new ministry were dooming the national assembly in addition to its being the high altar and castle of despotism became the proper object to begin with this enterprise broke up the new ministry who began now to fly from the ruin they had prepared for others the troops of broglio dispersed and himself fled also mr burke has spoken a great deal about plots but he has never once spoken of this plot against the national assembly and the liberties of the nation and that he might not he has passed over all the circumstances that might throw it in his way the exiles who have fled from france whose case he so much interests himself in and from whom he has had his lesson fled in consequence of the miscarriage of this plot no plot was formed against them they were plotting against others and those who fell met not unjustly the punishment they were preparing to execute but will mr burke say that if this plot contrived with the subtlety of an ambuscade had succeeded the successful party would have restrained their wrath so soon let the history of all governments answer the question whom has the national assembly brought to the scaffold none they were themselves the devoted victims of this plot and they have not retaliated why then are they charged with revenge they have not acted in the tremendous breaking forth of a whole people in which all degrees tempers and characters are confounded delivering themselves by a miracle of exertion from the destruction mediated against them is it to be expected that nothing will happen when men are sore with the sense of oppressions and menaced with the prospects of new ones is the calmness of philosophy or the palsy of insensibility to be looked for mr burke exclaims against outrage yet the greatest is that which himself has committed his book is a volume of outrage not apologized for by the impulse of a moment but cherished through the space of ten months yet mr burke has no provocation no life no interest at stake more of the citizens fell in this struggle than of their opponents but four or five persons were seized by the populace and instantly put to death the governor of the bastille and the mayor of paris who was detected in the act of betraying them and afterwards foulon one of the new ministry and berthier his son-in-law who had accepted the office of intendant of paris their heads were stuck upon spikes and carried about the city and it is upon this mode of punishment that mr burke builds a great part of his tragic scene let us therefore examine how men came by the idea of punishing in this manner they learn it from the governments they live under and retaliate the punishments they have been accustomed to behold the heads stuck upon spikes which remained for years upon temple bar differed nothing in the horror of the scene from those carried about upon spikes at paris yet this was done by the english government it may perhaps be said that it signifies nothing to a man what is done to him after he is dead but it signifies much to the living it either tortures their feelings or hardens their hearts and in either case it instructs them how to punish when power falls into their hands lay then the axe to the root and teach governments humanity it is their sanguinary punishments which corrupt mankind in england the punishment in certain cases is by hanging drawing and quartering the heart of the sufferer is cut out and held up to the view of the populace in france under the former government the punishments were not less barbarous who does not remember the execution of damien torn to pieces by horses the effect of those cruel spectacles exhibited to the populace is to destroy tenderness or excite revenge and by the base and false idea of governing men by terror instead of reason they become precedents it is over the lowest class of mankind that government by terror is intended to operate and it is on them that it operates to the worst effect they have sense enough to feel they are the objects aimed at and they inflict in their turn the examples of terror they have been instructed to practice there is in all european countries a large class of people of that description which in england is called the mob of this class were those who committed the burnings and devastations in london in seventeen eighty and of this class were those who carried the heads on iron spikes in paris 
foulon and berthier were taken up in the country and sent to paris to undergo their examination at the hotel de ville for the national assembly immediately on the new ministry coming into office passed a decree which they communicated to the king and cabinet that they the national assembly would hold the ministry of which foulon was one responsible for the measures they were advising and pursuing but the mob incensed at the appearance of foulon and berthier tore them from their conductors before they were carried to the hotel de ville and executed them on the spot why then does mr burke charge outrages of this kind on a whole people as well may he charge the riots and outrages of seventeen eighty on all the people of london or those in ireland on all his countrymen but everything we see or hear offensive to our feelings and derogatory to the human character should lead to other reflections than those of reproach even the beings who commit them have some claim to our consideration how then is it that such vast classes of mankind as are distinguished by the appellation of the vulgar or the ignorant mob are so numerous in all old countries the instant we ask ourselves this question reflection feels an answer they rise as an unavoidable consequence out of the ill construction of all old governments in europe england included with the rest it is by distortedly exalting some men that others are distortedly debased till the whole is out of nature a vast mass of mankind are degradedly thrown into the background of the human picture to bring forward with greater glare the puppet show of state and aristocracy in the commencement of a revolution those men are rather the followers of the camp than of the standard of liberty and have yet to be instructed how to reverence it i give to mr burke all his theatrical exaggerations for facts and i then ask him if they do not establish the certainty of what i here lay down admitting them to be true they show the necessity of the french revolution as much as any one thing he could have asserted these outrages were not the effect of the principles of the revolution but of the degraded mind that existed before the revolution and which the revolution is calculated to reform place them then to their proper cause and take the reproach of them to your own side it is the honor of the national assembly and the city of paris that during such a tremendous scene of arms and confusion beyond the control of all authority they have been able by the influence of example and exhortation to restrain so much never were more pains taken to instruct and enlighten mankind and to make them see that their interest consisted in their virtue and not in their revenge than have been displayed in the revolution of france i now proceed to make some remarks on mr burke's account of the expedition to versailles october the fifth and sixth end of part three of thirteen Section 7 of Rights of Man by Thomas Paine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rights of Man, Part the First, being an answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French Revolution. Part 7 of 13. i can consider mr burke's book in scarcely any other light than a dramatic performance and he must i think have considered it in the same light himself by the poetical liberties he has taken of omitting some facts distorting others and making the whole machinery bend to produce a stage effect of this kind is his account of the expedition to versailles he begins this account by omitting the only facts which as causes are known to be true everything beyond these is conjecture even in paris and he then works up a tale accommodated to his own passions and prejudices it is to be observed throughout mr burke's book that he never speaks of plots against the revolution and it is from those plots that all the mischiefs have arisen it suits his purpose to exhibit the consequences without their causes it is one of the arts of the drama to do so if the crimes of men were exhibited with their sufferings stage effect would sometimes be lost and the audience would be inclined to approve where it was intended they should commiserate after all the investigations that have been made into this intricate affair 
the expedition to versailles it still remains enveloped in all that kind of mystery which ever accompanies events produced more from a concurrence of awkward circumstances than from fixed design while the characters of men are forming as is always the case in revolutions there is a reciprocal suspicion and a disposition to misinterpret each other and even parties directly opposite in principle will sometimes concur in pushing forward the same movement with very different views and with the hopes of its producing very different consequences a great deal of this may be discovered in this embarrassed affair and yet the issue of the whole was what nobody had in view the only things certainly known are that considerable uneasiness was at this time excited at paris by the delay of the king in not sanctioning and forwarding the decrees of the national assembly particularly that of the declaration of the rights of man and the decrees of the fourth of august which contained the foundation principles on which the constitution was to be erected the kindest and perhaps the fairest conjecture upon this matter is that some of the ministers intended to make remarks and observations upon certain parts of them before they were finally sanctioned and sent to the provinces but be this as it may the enemies of the revolution derived hope from the delay and the friends of the revolution uneasiness during this state of suspense the garde de corps which was composed as such resumes generally are of persons much connected with the court gave an entertainment at versailles october the first to some foreign regiments then arrived and when the entertainment was at the height on a signal given the garde de corps tore the national cockade from their hats trampled it underfoot and replaced it with a counter cockade prepared for the purpose an indignity of this kind amounted to defiance it was like declaring war and if men will give challenges they must expect consequences but all this mr burke has carefully kept out of sight he begins his account by saying Quote, history will record that on the morning of the sixth october seventeen eighty nine the king and queen of france after a day of confusion alarm dismay and slaughter lay down under the pledged security of public faith to indulge nature in a few hours of respite and troubled melancholy repose End quote. this is neither the sober style of history nor the intention of it it leaves everything to be guessed at and mistaken one would at least think there had been a battle and a battle there probably would have been had it not been for the moderating prudence of those whom mr burke involves in his censures by his keeping the garde de corps out of sight mr burke has afforded himself the dramatic license of putting the king and queen in their places as if the object of the expedition was against them but to return to my account this conduct of the garde de corps as might well be expected alarmed and enraged the partisans the colors of the cause and the cause itself were become too united to mistake the intention of the insult and the partisans were determined to call the garde de corps to an account there was certainly nothing of the cowardice of assassination in marching in the face of the day to demand satisfaction if such a phrase may be used of a body of armed men who had voluntarily given defiance but the circumstance which serves to throw this affair into embarrassment is that the enemies of the revolution appear to have encouraged it as well as its friends the one hoped to prevent a civil war by checking it in time and the other to make one the hopes of those opposed to the revolution rested in making the king of their party and getting him from versailles to metz where they expected to collect a force and set up a standard we have therefore two different objects presenting themselves at the same time and to be accomplished by the same means the one to chastise the garde de corps which was the object of the partisans and the other to render the confusion of such a scene an inducement to the king to set off for metz on the fifth of october a very numerous body of women and men in the disguise of women collected around the hotel de ville or town hall at paris and set off for versailles their professed object was the garde de corps but prudent men readily recollect that mischief is more easily begun than ended and this impressed itself with the more force from the suspicions already stated and the irregularity of such a cavalcade 
as soon therefore as a sufficient force could be collected monsieur de lafayette by orders from the civil authority of paris set off after them at the head of twenty thousand of the paris militia the revolution could derive no benefit from confusion and its opposers might by an amiable and spirited manner of address he had hitherto been fortunate in calming disquietudes and in this he was extraordinarily successful to frustrate therefore the hopes of those who might seek to improve this scene into a sort of justifiable necessity for the king's quitting versailles and withdrawing to metz and to prevent at the same time the consequences that might ensue between the garde de corps and this phalanx of men and women he forwarded expresses to the king that he was on his march to versailles by the orders of the civil authority of paris for the purpose of peace and protection expressing at the same time the necessity of restraining the garde de corps from firing upon the people he arrived at versailles between ten and eleven at night the garde de corps was drawn up and the people had arrived some time before but everything had remained suspended wisdom and policy now consisted in changing a scene of danger into a happy event m de lafayette became the mediator between the enraged parties and the king to remove the uneasiness which had arisen from the delay already stated sent for the president of the national assembly and signed the declaration of the rights of man and such other parts of the constitution as were in readiness it was now about one in the morning everything appeared to be composed and a general congratulation took place by the beat of a drum a proclamation was made that the citizens of versailles would give the hospitality of their houses to their fellow citizens of paris those who could not be accommodated in this manner remained in the streets or took up their quarters in the churches and at two o'clock the king and queen retired in this state matters passed till the break of day when a fresh disturbance arose from the censurable conduct of some of both parties for such characters there will be in all such scenes one of the guard de corps appeared at one of the windows of the palace and the people who had remained during the night in the streets accosted him with reviling and provocative language instead of retiring as in such a case prudence would have dictated he presented his musket fired and killed one of the paris militia the peace being thus broken the people rushed into the palace in quest of the offender they attacked the quarters of the garde de corps within the palace and pursued them throughout the avenues of it and to the apartments of the king on this tumult not the queen only as mr burke has represented it but every person in the palace was awakened and alarmed and m de lafayette had a second time to interpose between the parties the event of which was that the garde de corps put on the national cockade and the matter ended as by oblivion after the loss of two or three lives during the latter part of the time in which this confusion was acting the king and queen were in public at the balcony and neither of them concealed for safety's sake as mr burke insinuates matters being thus appeased and tranquillity restored a general acclamation broke forth of la roi à paris la roi à paris the king to paris it was a shout of peace and immediately accepted on the part of the king by this measure all future projects of trepanning the king to metz and setting up the standard of opposition to the constitution were prevented and the suspicions extinguished the king and his family reached paris in the evening and were congratulated on their arrival by m bailey the mayor of paris in the name of the citizens mr burke who throughout his book confounds things persons and principles as in his remarks on m bailey's address confounded time also he censures m bailey for calling it un bonjour a good day mr burke should have informed himself that this scene took up the space of two days the day on which it began with every appearance of danger and mischief and the day on which it terminated without the mischiefs that threatened and that it is to this peaceful termination that m belly alludes and to the arrival of the king at paris not less than three hundred thousand persons arranged themselves in the procession from versailles to paris and not an act of molestation was committed during the whole march 
mr burke on the authority of monsieur lally tolendal a deserter from the national assembly says that on entering paris the people shouted to les avis à la lanterne all bishops to be hanged at the lanthorn or lamp posts it is surprising that nobody could hear this but lally tolendal and that nobody should believe it but mr burke it has not the least connection with any part of the transaction and is totally foreign to every circumstance of it the bishops had never been introduced before in any scene of mr burke's drama why then are they all at once the altogether tout à coup et tout ensemble introduced now mr burke brings forward his bishops and his lanthorn-like figures in a magic lanthorn and raises his scenes by contrast instead of connection but it serves to show with the rest of his book what little credit ought to be given where even probability is set at defiance for the purpose of defaming and with this reflection instead of a soliloquy in praise of chivalry as mr burke has done i close the account of the expedition to versailles End of part four of thirteen section eight of rights of man by thomas paine this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rights of Man, Part the First, being an answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French Revolution. Part Five of Thirteen. I have now to follow Mr. Burke through a pathless wilderness of rhapsodies and a sort of descant upon governments in which he asserts whatever he pleases on the presumption of its being believed without offering either evidence or reasons for doing so. Before anything can be reasoned upon to a conclusion, certain facts, principles, or data to reason from must be established, admitted, or denied. Mr. Burke, with his usual outrage, abused the Declaration of the Rights of Man, published by the National Assembly of France, as the basis on which the Constitution of France is built. This he calls, quote, paltry and blurred sheets of paper about the rights of man, end quote. Does Mr. Burke mean to deny that man has any rights? If he does, then he must mean that there are no such things as rights anywhere, and that he has none himself, for who is there in the world but man? But if Mr. Burke means to admit that man has rights, the question then will be, what are those rights, and how man came by them originally? The error of those who reason by precedents drawn from antiquity respecting the rights of man is that they do not go far enough into antiquity. They do not go the whole way. They stop in some of the intermediate stages of an hundred or a thousand years and produce what was then done as the rule for the present day. This is no authority at all. If we travel still farther into antiquity, we shall find a direct contrary opinion and practice prevailing, and if antiquity is to be authority, a thousand such authorities may be produced, successively contradicting each other, but if we proceed on, we shall at last come out right. We shall come to the time when man came from the hand of his maker. What was he then? Man. Man was his high and only title, and a higher cannot be given him but of titles I shall speak hereafter. We are now got at the origin of man, at the origin of his rights. As to the manner in which the world has been governed from that day to this, it is no farther any concern of ours than to make a proper use of the errors or the improvements which the history of it presents. Those who lived an hundred or a thousand years ago were then moderns, as we are now. They had their ancients, and those ancients had others, and we also shall be ancients in our turn. If the mere name of antiquity is to govern in the affairs of life, the people who are to live an hundred or a thousand years hence may as well take us for a precedent, as we make a precedent of those who lived an hundred or a thousand years ago. The fact is that portions of antiquity, by proving everything, establish nothing it is authority against authority all the way till we come to the divine origin of the rights of man at the creation here our inquiries find a resting place and our reason finds a home if a dispute about the rights of man has arisen at the distance of an hundred years from the creation it is to this source of authority they must have referred and it is to this same source of authority that we must now refer 
though i mean not to touch upon any sectarian principle of religion yet it may be worth observing that the genealogy of christ is traced to adam why then not trace the rights of man to the creation of man i will answer the question because there have been upstart governments thrusting themselves between and presumptuously working to unmake man if any generation of men ever possessed the right of dictating the mode by which the world should be governed for ever it was the first generation that existed and if that generation did not do it no succeeding generation can show any authority for doing it nor can set any up the illuminating and divine principles of the equal rights of man for it has its origin from the maker of man relates not only to the living individuals but to generations of men succeeding each other every generation is equal in rights to generations which preceded it by the same rule that every individual is born equal in rights with his contemporary every history of the creation and every traditionary account whether from the lettered or unlettered world however they may vary in their opinion or belief of certain particulars all agree in establishing one point the unity of man by which i mean that men are all of one degree and consequently that all men are born equal and with equal natural right in the same manner as if posterity had been continued by creation instead of generation the latter being the only mode by which the former is carried forward and consequently every child born into the world must be considered as deriving its existence from god the world is as new to him as it was to the first man that existed and his natural right in it is of the same kind the mosaic account of creation whether taken as divine authority or merely historical is full to this point the unity or equality of man the expression admits of no controversy quote, and god said let us make man in our own image in the image of god created he him male and female created he them End quote. the distinction of sexes is pointed out but no other distinction is even implied if this be not divine authority it is at least historical authority and shows that the equality of man so far from being a modern doctrine is the oldest upon record it is also to be observed that all the religions known in the world are founded so far as they relate to man on the unity of man as being all of one degree whether in heaven or in hell or in whatever state man may be supposed to exist hereafter the good and the bad are the only distinctions nay even the laws of government are obliged to slide into this principle by making degrees to consist in crimes and not in persons it is one of the greatest of all truths and of the highest advantage to cultivate by considering man in this light and by instructing him to consider himself in this light it places him in a close connection with all his duties whether to his creator or to the creation of which he is a part and it is only when he forgets his origin or to use a more fashionable phrase his birth and family that he becomes dissolute it is not among the least of the evils of the present existing governments in all parts of europe that man considered as man is thrown back to a vast distance from his maker and the artificial chasm filled up with a succession of barriers or sort of turnpike gates through which he has to pass i will quote mr burke's catalogue of barriers that he has set up between man and his maker putting himself in the character of a herald he says quote, we fear god we look with awe to kings with affection to parliaments with duty to magistrates with reverence to priests and with respect to nobility End quote. mr burke has forgotten to put in chivalry he has also forgotten to put in peter the duty of a man is not a wilderness of turnpike gates through which he is to pass by tickets from one to the other it is plain and simple and consists of but two points his duty to god which every man must feel and with respect to his neighbor to do as he would be done by if those to whom power is delegated do well they will be respected if not they will be despised and with regard to those to whom no power is delegated but who assume it the rational world can know nothing of them hitherto we have spoken only and that but in part of the natural rights of man we have now to consider the civil rights of man and to show how the one originates from the other 
man did not enter into society to become worse than he was before nor to have fewer rights than he had before but to have those rights better secured his natural rights are the foundation of all his civil rights but in order to pursue this distinction with more precision it will be necessary to mark the different qualities of natural and civil rights a few words will explain this natural rights are those which appertain to man in right of his existence of this kind are all the intellectual rights or rights of the mind and also all those rights of acting as an individual for his own comfort and happiness which are not injurious to the natural rights of others civil rights are those which appertain to man in right of his being a member of society every civil right has for its foundation some natural right pre-existing in the individual but to the enjoyment of which his individual power is not in all cases sufficiently competent of this kind are those which relate to security and protection from this short review it will be easy to distinguish between the class of natural rights which man retains after entering into society and those which he throws into the common stock as a member of society the natural rights which he retains are all those in which the power to execute is as perfect in the individual as the right itself among this class as is before mentioned are all the intellectual rights or rights of the mind consequently religion is one of those rights the natural rights which are not retained are all those in which though the right is perfect in the individual the power to execute them is defective they answer not his purpose a man by natural right has a right to judge in his own cause and so far as the right of the mind is concerned he never surrenders it but what availeth it him to judge if he has not power to redress he therefore deposits this right in the common stock of society and takes the an of society of which he is a part in preference and in addition to his own society grants him nothing every man is a proprietor in society and draws on the capital as a matter of right from these premises two or three certain conclusions will follow first that every civil right grows out of a natural right or in other words is a natural right exchanged secondly that civil power properly considered as such is made up of the aggregate of that class of the natural rights of man which becomes defective in the individual in point of power and answers not his purpose but when collected to a focus becomes competent to the purpose of every one thirdly that the power produced from the aggregate of natural rights imperfect in power in the individual cannot be applied to invade the natural rights which are retained in the individual and in which the power to execute is as perfect as the right itself we have now in a few words traced man from a natural individual to a member of society and shown or endeavored to show the quality of the natural rights retained and of those which are exchanged for civil rights let us now apply these principles to government. End of Part 5, Section 13 Section 9 of Rights of Man by Thomas Paine This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rights of Man, Part the First, being an answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French Revolution. Part 6 of 13 In casting our eyes over the world, it is extremely easy to distinguish the governments which have arisen out of society or out of the social compact and from those which have not. But to place this in a clearer light than what a single glance may afford, it will be proper to take a review of the several sources from which governments have arisen and on which they have been founded they may be all comprehended under three heads first superstition secondly power thirdly the common interest of society and the common rights of man the first was a government of priestcraft the second of conquerors and the third of reason when a set of artful men pretended through the medium of oracles to hold intercourse with the deity as familiarly as they now march up the back stairs in european courts the world was completely under the government of superstition the oracles were consulted and whatever they were made to say became the law and this sort of government lasted as long as this sort of superstition lasted 
after these a race of conquerors arose whose government like that of william the conqueror was founded in power and the sword assumed the name of a scepter governments thus established last as long as the power to support them lasts but that they might avail themselves of every engine in their favor they united fraud to force and set up an idol which they called divine right in which in imitation of the pope who affects to be spiritual and temporal and in contradiction to the founder of the christian religion twisted itself afterwards into an idol of another shape called church and state the key of st peter and the key of the treasury became quartered on one another and the wondering cheated multitude worshipped the invention when i contemplate the natural dignity of man when i feel for nature has not been kind enough to me to blunt my feelings for the honor and happiness of its character i become irritated at the attempt to govern mankind by force and fraud as if they were all knaves and fools and can scarcely avoid disgust at those who are thus imposed upon we have now to review the governments which arise out of society in contradistinction to those which arose out of superstition and conquest it has been thought a considerable advance towards establishing the principles of freedom to say that government is a compact between those who govern and those who are governed but this cannot be true because it is putting the effect before the cause for as man must have existed before governments existed there necessarily was a time when governments did not exist and consequently there could originally exist no governors to form such a compact with the fact therefore must be that the individuals themselves each in his own personal and sovereign right entered into a compact with each other to produce a government and this is the only mode in which governments have a right to arise and the only principle on which they have a right to exist to possess ourselves of a clear idea of what government is or ought to be we must trace it to its origin in doing this we shall easily discover that governments must have arisen either out of the people or over the people mr burke has made no distinction he investigates nothing to its source and therefore he confounds everything but he has signified his intention of undertaking at some future opportunity a comparison between the constitution of england and france as he thus renders it a subject of controversy by throwing the gauntlet i take him upon his own ground it is in high challenges that high truths have the right of appearing and i accept it with the more readiness because it affords me at the same time an opportunity of pursuing the subject with respect to governments arising out of society but it will be first necessary to define what is meant by a constitution it is not sufficient that we adopt the word we must fix also a standard signification to it a constitution is not a thing in name only but in fact it has not an ideal but a real existence and wherever it cannot be produced in a visible form there is none a constitution is a thing antecedent to a government and a government is only the creature of a constitution the constitution of a country is not the act of its government but of the people constituting its government it is the body of elements to which you can refer and quote article by article and which contains the principles on which the government shall be established the manner in which it shall be organized the powers it shall have the mode of elections the duration of parliaments or by what other name such bodies may be called the powers which the executive part of the government shall have and in fine everything that relates to the complete organization of a civil government and the principles on which it shall act and by which it shall be bound a constitution therefore is to a government what the laws made afterwards by that government are to a court of judicature the court of judicature does not make the laws neither can it alter them it only acts in conformity to the laws made and the government is in like manner governed by the constitution can then mr burke produce the english constitution if he cannot we may fairly conclude that though it has been so much talked about no such thing as a constitution exists or ever did exist and consequently that the people have yet a constitution to form 
mr burke will not i presume deny the position i have already advanced namely that governments arise either out of the people or over the people the english government is one of those which arose out of a conquest and not out of society and consequently it arose over the people and though it has been much modified from the opportunity of circumstances since the time of william the conqueror the country has never yet regenerated itself and is therefore without a constitution i readily perceive the reason why mr burke declined going into the comparison between the english and french constitutions because he could not but perceive when he sat down to the task that no such a thing as a constitution existed on his side of the question his book is certainly bulky enough to have contained all he could say on this subject and yet it would have been the best manner in which people could have judged of their separate merits why then has he declined the only thing that was worth while to write upon it was the strongest ground he could take if the advantages were on his side but the weakest if they were not and his declining to take it is either a sign that he could not possess it or could not maintain it mr burke said in a speech last winter in parliament quote, that when the national assembly first met in three orders parentheses, the tiers etat the clergy and the noblesse and parenthesis france had then a good constitution end quote. this shows among numerous other instances that mr burke does not understand what a constitution is the persons so met there were not a constitution but a convention to make a constitution the present national assembly of france is strictly speaking the personal social compact the members of it are the delegates of the nation in its original character future assemblies will be the delegates of the nation in its organized character the authority of the present assembly is different from what the authority of future assemblies will be the authority of the present one is to form a constitution the authority of future assemblies will be to legislate according to the principles and forms prescribed in that constitution and if experience should hereafter show that alterations amendments or additions are necessary the constitution will point out the mode by which such things shall be done and not leave it to the discretionary power of the future government a government on the principles of which constitutional governments arising out of society are established cannot have the right of altering itself if it had it would be arbitrary it might make itself what it pleased and wherever such a right is set up it shows there is no constitution the act by which the english parliament empowered itself to sit seven years show there is no constitution in england it might by the same self-authority have set any great number of years or for life the bill which the present mr pitt brought into parliament some years ago to reform parliament was on the same erroneous principle the right of reform is in the nation in its original character and the constitutional method would be by a general convention elected for the purpose there is moreover a paradox in the idea of vitiated bodies reforming themselves from these preliminaries i proceed to draw some comparisons i have already spoken of the declaration of rights and as i mean to be as concise as possible i shall proceed to other parts of the french constitution the constitution of france says that every man who pays a tax of sixty sous per annum two shillings six pence english is an elector what article will mr burke place against this can anything be more limited and at the same time more capricious than the qualification of electors is in england limited because not one man in an hundred i speak much within compass is admitted to vote capricious because the lowest character that can be supposed to exist and who is not so much as the visible means of an honest livelihood is an elector in some places while in other places the man who pays very large taxes and has a known fair character and the farmer who rents to the amount of three or four hundred pounds a year with a property on that farm to three or four times that amount is not admitted to be an elector everything is out of nature as mr burke says on another occasion in this strange chaos and all sorts of follies are blended with all sorts of crimes william the conqueror and his descendants parceled out the country in this manner and bribed some parts of it by what they called charters to hold the other parts of it the better subjected to their will 
this is the reason why so many of those charters abound in cornwall the people were averse to the government established at the conquest and the towns were garrisoned and bribed to enslave the country all the old charters are the badges of this conquest and it is from this source that the capriciousness of election arises the french constitution says that the number of representatives for any place shall be in a ratio to the number of taxable inhabitants or electors what article will mr burke place against this the country of york which contains nearly a million of souls sends two county members and so does the county of rutland which contains not an hundredth part of that number the old town of sarum which contains not three houses sends two members and the town of manchester which contains upward of sixty thousand souls is not admitted to send any is there any principle in these things it is admitted that all this is altered but there is much to be done yet before we have a fair representation of the people is there anything by which you can trace the marks of freedom or discover those of wisdom no wonder then mr burke has declined the comparison and endeavored to lead his readers from the point by a wild unsystematical display of paradoxical rhapsodies the french constitution says that the national assembly shall be elected every two years what article will mr burke place against this why that the nation has no right at all in the case that the government is perfectly arbitrary with respect to this point and he can quote for his authority the president of a former parliament the french constitution says there shall be no game laws that the farmer on whose lands wild game shall be found for it is by the produce of his lands they are fed shall have a right to what he can take that there shall be no monopolies of any kind that all trades shall be free and every man free to follow any occupation by which he can procure an honest livelihood and in any place town or city throughout the nation what will mr burke say to this in england game is made the property of those at whose expense it is not fed and with respect to monopolies the country is cut up into monopolies every chartered town is an aristocratical monopoly in itself and the qualification of electors proceeds out of those chartered monopolies is this freedom is this what mr burke means by a constitution in these chartered monopolies a man coming from another part of the country is hunted from them as if he were a foreign enemy an englishman is not free of his own country every one of those places presents a barrier in his way and tells him he is not a freeman that he has no rights within these monopolies are other monopolies in a city such for instance as bath which contains between twenty and thirty thousand inhabitants the right of electing representatives to parliament is monopolized by about thirty-one persons and within these monopolies are still others a man even of the same town whose parents were not in circumstances to give him an occupation is debarred in many cases from the natural right of acquiring one be his genius or industry what it may are these things examples to hold out to a country regenerating itself from slavery like france certainly they are not and certain am i that when the people of england come to reflect upon them they will like france annihilate those badges of ancient depression those traces of a conquered nation had mr burke possessed talents similar to the author of on the wealth of nations he would have comprehended all the parts which enter into and by assemblage form a constitution he would have reasoned from minutia to magnitude it is not from his prejudices only but from the disorderly cast of his genius that he is unfitted for the subject he writes upon even his genius is without a constitution it is a genius at random and not a genius constituted but he must say something he has therefore mounted in the air like a balloon to draw the eyes of the multitude from the ground they stand upon much is to be learned from the french constitution conquest and tyranny transplanted themselves with william the conqueror from normandy into england and the country is yet disfigured with the marks may then the example of all france contribute to regenerate the freedom which a province of it destroyed the french constitution says that to preserve the national representation from being corrupt no member of the national assembly shall be an officer of the government a placeman or a pensioner what will mr burke place against this 
i will whisper his answer loaves and fishes ah this government of loaves and fishes has more mischief in it than people have yet reflected on the national assembly has made the discovery and it holds out the example to the world had governments agreed to quarrel on purpose to fleece their countries by taxes they could not have succeeded better than they have done everything in the english government appears to me the reverse of what it ought to be and of what it is said to be the parliament imperfectly and capriciously elected as it is is nevertheless supposed to hold the national purse in trust for the nation but in the manner in which an english parliament is constructed it is like a man being both mortgager and mortgagee and in the case of misapplication of trust it is the criminal sitting in judgment upon himself if those who vote the supplies are the same persons who receive the supplies when voted and are to account for the expenditure of those supplies to those who voted them it is themselves accountable to themselves and the comedy of errors concludes with the pantomime of hush neither the ministerial party nor the opposition will touch upon this case the national purse is the common hack which each mounts upon it is like what the country people call quote, ride and tie you ride a little way and then tie footnote it is a practice in some parts of the country when two travelers have but one horse which like the national purse will not carry double that the one mounts and rides two or three miles ahead and then ties the horse to a gate and walks on when the second traveler arrives he takes the horse rides on and passes his companion a mile or two and ties again and so on ride and tie and footnote they order these things better in france the french constitution says that the right of war and peace is in the nation where else should it reside but in those who are to pay the expense in england this right is said to reside in a metaphor shown at the tower for sixpence or a shilling apiece so are the lions and it would be a step nearer to reason to say it resided in them for any inanimate metaphor is no more than a hat or a cap we can all see the absurdity of worshipping aaron's molten calf or nebuchadnezzar's golden image but why do men continue to practise themselves the absurdities they despise in others it may with reason be said that in the manner the english nation is represented it signifies not where the right resides whether in the crown or in the parliament war is the common harvest of all those who participate in the division and expenditure of public money in all countries it is the art of conquering at home the object of it is an increase of revenue and as revenue cannot be increased without taxes a pretense must be made for expenditure in reviewing the history of the english government its wars and its taxes a bystander not blinded by prejudice nor warped by interest would declare that taxes were not raised to carry on wars but that wars were raised to carry on taxes mr burke as a member of the house of commons is a part of the english government and though he professes himself an enemy of war he abuses the french constitution which seeks to explode it he holds up the english government as a model in all its parts to france but he should first know the remarks which the french make upon it they contend in favor of their own that the portion of liberty enjoyed in england is just enough to enslave a country more productively than by despotism and that the real object of all despotism is revenue a government so formed obtains more than it could do either by direct despotism or in a full state of freedom it is therefore on the ground of interest opposed to both they account also for the readiness which always appears in such governments for engaging in wars by remarking on the different motives which produce them in despotic governments wars are the effect of pride but in those governments in which they become the means of taxation they acquire thereby a more permanent promptitude the french constitution therefore to provide against both these evils has taken away the power of declaring war from kings and ministers and placed the right where the expense must fall when the question of the right of war and peace was agitated in the national assembly the people of england appeared to be much interested in the event and highly to applaud the decision as a principle it applies as much to one country as another 
william the conqueror as a conqueror held this power of war and peace in himself and his descendants have ever since claimed it under him as a right although mr burke has asserted the right of the parliament at the revolution to bind and control the nation and posterity for ever he denies at the same time that the parliament or the nation had any right to alter what he calls the succession of the crown in anything but in part or by a sort of modification by his taking this ground he throws the case back to the norman conquest and by thus running a line of succession springing from william the conqueror to the present day he makes it necessary to inquire who and what william the conqueror was and where he came from and into the origin history and nature of what are called prerogatives everything must have had a beginning and the fog of time and antiquity should be penetrated to discover it let then mr burke bring forward his william of normandy for it is to this origin that his argument goes it also unfortunately happens in running this line of succession that another line parallel thereto presents itself which is that if the succession runs in the line of conquest the nation runs in the line of being conquered and it ought to rescue itself from this reproach but it will perhaps be said that though the power of declaring war descends in the heritage of the conquest it is held in check by the right of parliament to withhold the supplies it will always happen when a thing is originally wrong that amendments do not make it right and it often happens that they do as much mischief one way as good the other and such is the case here for if the one rashly declares war as a matter of right and the other peremptorily withholds the supplies as a matter of right the remedy becomes as bad or worse than the disease the one forces the nation to a combat and the other ties its hands but the more probable issue is that the contest will end in a collusion between the parties and be made a screen to both on this question of war three things are to be considered first the right of declaring it secondly the expense of supporting it thirdly the mode of conducting it after it is declared the french constitution places the right where the expense must fall and this union can only be in the nation the mode of conducting it after it is declared it consigns to the executive department were this the case in all countries we should hear but little more of wars before i proceed to consider other parts of the french constitution and by way of relieving the fatigue of argument i will introduce an anecdote which i got from dr franklin End of part six of thirteen. Section ten of Rights of Man by Thomas Paine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rights of Man, part the first, being an answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French Revolution. Part seven of thirteen. while dr franklin resided in france as minister from america during the war he had numerous proposals made to him by projectors of every country and of every kind who wished to go to the land that floweth with milk and honey america and among the rest there was one who offered himself to be king he introduced his proposal to the doctor by letter which is now in the hands of mr beaumarchais of paris stating first that as the americans had dismissed or sent away their king that they would want another secondly that himself was a norman thirdly that he was of a more ancient family than the dukes of normandy and of a more honorable descent his line having never been bastardized fourthly that there was already a precedent in england of kings coming out of normandy and on these grounds he rested his offer enjoining that the doctor would forward it to america but as the doctor neither did this nor yet sent him an answer the projector wrote a second letter in which he did not it is true threaten to go over and conquer america but only with great dignity proposed that if his offer was not accepted an acknowledgment of about thirty thousand pounds might be made to him for his generosity 
now as all arguments respecting succession must necessarily connect that succession with some beginning mr burke's arguments on this subject go to show that there is no english origin of kings and that they are descendants of the norman line in right of the conquest it may therefore be of service to his doctrine to make this story known and to inform him that in case of that natural extinction to which all mortality is subject kings may again be had from normandy on more reasonable terms than william the conqueror and consequently that the good people of england at the revolution of sixteen eighty eight might have done much better had such a generous norman as this known their wants and they had known his the chivalric character which mr burke so much admires is certainly much easier to make a bargain with than a hard-dealing dutchman but to return to the matters of the constitution the french constitution says there shall be no titles and of consequence all that class of equivocal generation in which some countries is called aristocracy and in others nobility is done away and the peer is exalted into the man titles are but nicknames and every nickname is a title the thing is perfectly harmless in itself but it marks a sort of foppery in the human character which degrades it it reduces man into the diminutive of man in things which are great and the counterfeit of women in things which are little it talks about its fine blue ribbon like a girl and shows its new garter like a child a certain writer of some antiquity says quote, when i was a child i thought as a child but when i became a man i put away childish things End quote. it is properly from the elevated mind of france that the folly of titles has fallen it has outgrown the baby clothes of count and duke and breached itself into manhood france has not leveled it has exalted it has put down the dwarf to set up the man the punyism of a senseless word like duke count or earl has ceased to please even those who possessed them have disowned the gibberish and as they outgrew the rickets have despised the rattle the genuine mind of man thirsting for its native home society condemns the gugas that separate him from it titles are like circles drawn by the magician's wand to contract the sphere of man's felicity he lives immured within the bastille of a word and surveys at a distance the envied life of man is it then any wonder that titles should fall in france is it not a greater wonder that they should be kept up anywhere what are they what is their worth and what is their amount when we think or speak of a judge or a general we associate it with ideas of office and character we think of gravity in one and bravery in the other but when we use the word merely as a title no ideas associate with it through all the vocabulary of adam there is not such an animal as a duke or a count neither can we connect any certain ideas with the words whether they mean strength or weakness wisdom or folly a child or a man or the rider or the horse is all equivocal what respect then can be paid to that which describes nothing and which means nothing imagination has given figure and character to centaurs satyrs and down to all the fairy tribe but titles baffle even the powers of fancy and are a chimerical nondescript but this is not all if a whole country is disposed to hold them in contempt all their value is gone and none will own them it is common opinion only that makes them anything or nothing or worse than nothing there is no occasion to take titles away for they take themselves away when society concurs to ridicule them this species of imaginary consequence has visibly declined in every part of europe and it hastens to its exit as the world of reason continues to rise there was a time when the lowest class of nobility was more thought of than the highest is now and when a man in armor riding through christendom in quest of adventure was more stared at than a modern duke the world has seen this folly fall and it has fallen by being laughed at and the farce of titles will follow its fate 
the patriots of france have discovered in good time that rank and dignity in society must take a new ground the old one has fallen through it must now take the substantial ground of character instead of the chimerical ground of titles and they have brought their titles to the altar and made of them a burnt offering to reason if no mischief had annexed itself to the folly of titles they would not have been worth a serious or formal destruction such as the national assembly have decreed them and this makes it necessary to inquire farther into the nature and character of aristocracy that then which is called aristocracy in some countries and nobility in others arose out of the governments founded upon conquest it was originally a military order for the purpose of supporting military government for such were all governments founded in conquest and to keep up a succession of this order for the purpose for which it was established all the younger branches of those families were disinherited and the law of primogenitorship set up the nature and character of aristocracy shows itself to us in this law it is the law against every other law of nature and nature herself calls for its destruction establish family justice and aristocracy falls by the aristocratical law of primogenitorship in a family of six children five are exposed aristocracy never has more than one child the rest are begotten to be devoured they are thrown to the cannibal for prey and the natural parent prepares the unnatural repast as everything which is out of nature in man affects more or less the interests of society so does this all the children which the aristocracy disowns which are all except the eldest are in general cast like orphans on the parish to be provided for by the public but at a greater charge unnecessary offices and places in governments and courts are created at the expense of the public to maintain them with what kind of parental reflections can a father or mother contemplate their younger offspring by nature they are children and by marriage they are heirs but by aristocracy they are bastards and orphans they are the flesh and blood of their parents in the one line and nothing akin to them in the other to restore therefore parents to their children and children to their parents relations to each other and man to society and to exterminate the monster aristocracy root and branch the french constitution has destroyed the law of primogenitorship here then lies the monster and mr burke if he pleases may write its epitaph end of part seven of thirteen Section 11 of Rights of Man by Thomas Paine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rights of Man, Part the First, being an answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French Revolution. Part 8 of 13. Hitherto we have considered aristocracy chiefly in one point of view. We have now to consider it in another but whether we view it before or behind or sideways or any way else domestically or publicly it is still a monster in france aristocracy had one feature less in its countenance than what it has in some other countries it did not compose a body of hereditary legislators it was not quote, a corporation of aristocracy end quote. For such I have heard Monsieur de Lafayette describe an English House of Peers. Let us then examine the grounds upon which the French Constitution has resolved against having such a house in France. Because, in the first place, as is already mentioned, aristocracy is kept up by family tyranny and injustice. Secondly, because there is an unnatural unfitness in an aristocracy to be legislators for a nation. Their ideas of distributive justice are corrupted at the very source. They begin life by trampling on all their younger brothers and sisters and relations of every kind, and are taught and educated so to do with what ideas of justice or honor can that man enter a house of legislation who absorbs in his own person the inheritance of a whole family of children or doles out to them some pitiful portion with the insolence of a gift thirdly because the idea of hereditary legislators is as inconsistent as that of hereditary judges or hereditary juries and as absurd as an hereditary mathematician or an hereditary wise man and as ridiculous as an hereditary poet laureate 
fourthly because a body of men holding themselves accountable to nobody ought not to be trusted by anybody fifthly because it is continuing the uncivilized principle of governments founded in conquest and the base idea of man having property in man and governing him by personal right sixthly because aristocracy has a tendency to deteriorate the human species by the universal economy of nature it is known and by the instance of the jews it is proved that the human species has a tendency to degenerate in any small number of persons when separated from the general stock of society and intermarrying constantly with each other it defeats even its pretended end and becomes in time the opposite of what is noble in man mr burke talks of nobility let him show what it is the greatest characters the world have known have arisen on the democratic floor aristocracy has not been able to keep a proportionate pace with democracy the artificial noble shrinks into a dwarf before the noble of nature and in the few instances of those for there are some in all countries in whom nature as by a miracle has survived in aristocracy those men despise it but it is time to proceed to a new subject the french constitution has reformed the condition of the clergy it has raised the income of the lower and middle classes and taken from the higher none are now less than twelve hundred livres fifty pounds sterling nor any higher than two or three thousand pounds what will mr burke place against this hear what he says he says quote, that the people of england can see without pain or grudging an archbishop proceed cannot see why it a duke they can see a bishop of durham or a bishop of winchester in possession of ten thousand pounds a year and cannot see why it is in worse hands than estates to a like amount in the hands of this earl or that squire End quote. and mr burke offers this as an example to france as to the first part whether the archbishop precedes the duke or the duke the bishop it is i believe to the people in general somewhat like sternhold and hopkins or hopkins and sternhold you may put what you please first and as i confess that i do not understand the merits of this case i will not contest it with mr burke but with respect to the latter i have something to say mr burke has not put the case right the comparison is out of order by being put between the bishop and the earl or the squire it ought to be put between the bishop and the curate and then it will stand thus quote, the people see without pain or grudging a bishop of durham or a bishop of winchester in possession of ten thousand pounds a year and a curate on thirty or forty pounds a year or less End quote no sir they certainly do not see those things without great pain or grudging it is a case that applies itself to every man's sense of justice and is one among many that calls aloud for a constitution in france the cry of the church the church was repeated as often as in mr burke's book and as loudly as when the dissenters bill was before the english parliament but the generality of the french clergy were not to be deceived by this cry any longer they knew that whatever the pretense might be it was they who were one of the principal objects of it it was the cry of the high beneficed clergy to prevent any regulation of income taking place between those of ten thousand pounds a year and the parish priest they therefore joined their case to those of every other oppressed class of men and by this union obtained redress the french constitution has abolished tithes that source of perpetual discontent between the tithe holder and the parishioner when land is held on tithe it is in the condition of an estate held between two parties the one receiving one-tenth and the other nine-tenths of the produce and consequently on principle of equity if the estate can be improved and made to produce by that improvement double or treble what it did before or in any other ratio the expense of such improvement ought to be borne in like proportion between the parties who are to share the produce but this is not the case in tithes the farmer bears the whole expense and the tithe holder takes a tenth of the improvement in addition to the original tenth and by this means gets the value of two tenths instead of one this is another case that calls for a constitution the french constitution hath abolished or renounced toleration and intolerance also and hath established universal right of conscience 
toleration is not the opposite of intolerance but it is the counterfeit of it both are despotisms the one assumes to itself the right of withholding liberty of conscience and the other of granting it the one is the pope armed with fire and faggot and the other is the pope selling or granting indulgences the former is church and state and the latter is church and traffic but toleration may be viewed in a much stronger light man worships not himself but his maker and the liberty of conscience which he claims is not for the service of himself but of his god in this case therefore we must necessarily have the associated idea of two things the mortal who renders the worship and the immortal being who is worshipped toleration therefore places itself not between man and man not between church and church nor between one denomination of religion and another but between god and man between the being who worships and the being who is worshipped and by the same act of assumed authority which it tolerates man to pay his worship it presumptuously and blasphemously sets itself up to tolerate the almighty to receive it were a bill brought into any parliament entitled quote, an act to tolerate or grant liberty to the almighty to receive the worship of a jew or a turk end quote, or quote, to prohibit the almighty from receiving it end quote, all men would startle and call it blasphemy there would be an uproar the presumption of toleration in religious matters would then present itself unmasked but the presumption is not the less because the name of man only appears to those laws for the associated idea of the worshipper and the worshipped cannot be separated who then art thou vain dust and ashes by whatever name thou art called whether a king a bishop a church or a state a parliament or anything else that obtrudest thine insignificance between the soul of man and its maker mind thine own concerns if he believes not as thou believest it is a proof that thou believest not as he believes and there is no earthly power can determine between you with respect to what are called denominations of religion if every one is left to judge of its own religion there is no such thing as a religion that is wrong but if they are to judge of each other's religion there is no such thing as a religion that is right and therefore all the world is right or all the world is wrong but with respect to religion itself without regard to names and as directing itself from the universal family of mankind to the divine object of all adoration it is man bringing to his maker the fruits of his heart and though those fruits may differ from each other like the fruits of the earth the grateful tribute of every one is accepted a bishop of durham or a bishop of winchester or the archbishop who heads the dukes will not refuse a tithe sheaf of wheat because it is not a cock of hay nor a cock of hay because it is not a sheaf of wheat nor a pig because it is neither one nor the other but these same persons under the figure of an established church will not permit their maker to receive the varied tithes of man's devotion end of part eight of thirteen Section 12 of Rights of Man by Thomas Paine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rights of Man, Part the First, being an answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French Revolution. Part 9 of 13. One of the continual choruses of Mr. Burke's book is Church and State. He does not mean some one particular church or some one particular state but any church and state and he uses the term as a general figure to hold forth the political doctrine of always uniting the church with the state in every country and he censures the national assembly for not having done this in france let us bestow a few thoughts on this subject all religions are in their nature kind and benign and united with principles of morality they could not have made proselytes at first by professing anything that was vicious cruel persecuting or immoral like everything else they had their beginning and they proceeded by persuasion exhortation and example how then is it that they lose their native mildness and become morose and intolerant it proceeds from the connection which mr burke recommends by engendering the church with the state 
a sort of mule animal capable only of destroying and not of breeding up is produced called the church established by law it is a stranger even from its birth to any parent mother on whom it is begotten and whom in time it kicks out and destroys the inquisition in spain does not proceed from the religion originally professed but from this mule animal engendered between the church and the state the burnings in smithfield proceeded from the same heterogeneous production and it was the regeneration of this strange animal in england afterwards that renewed rancor and irreligion among the inhabitants and that drove the people called quakers and dissenters to america persecution is not an original feature in any religion but it is always the strongly marked feature of all law religions or religions established by law take away the law establishment and every religion reassumes its original benignity in america a catholic priest is a good citizen a good character and a good neighbor an episcopalian minister is of the same description and this proceeds independently of the men from there being no law establishment in america if also we view this matter in a temporal sense we shall see the ill effects it has on the prosperity of nations the union of church and state has impoverished spain the revoking the edict of nance drove the silk manufacture from that country into england and church and state are now driving the cotton manufacture from england to america and france let then mr burke continue to preach his anti-political doctrine of church and state it will do some good the national assembly will not follow his advice but will benefit by his folly it was by observing the ill effects of it in england that america has been warned against it and it is by experiencing them in france that the national assembly have abolished it and like america have established universal right of conscience and universal right of citizenship footnote when in any country we see extraordinary circumstances taking place they naturally lead any man who has a talent for observation and investigation to inquire into the causes the manufacturers of manchester birmingham and sheffield are the principal manufacturers in england from whence did this arise a little observation will explain the case the principle and the generality of the inhabitants of those places are not of what is called in england the church established by law and they or their fathers for it is within but a few years withdrew from persecution of the chartered towns where test laws more particularly operate and established a sort of asylum for themselves in those places it was the only asylum that then offered for the rest of europe was worse but the case is now changing france and america bid all comers welcome and initiate them into all the rights of citizenship policy and interest therefore will but perhaps too late dictate in england what reason and justice could not those manufacturers are withdrawing and arising in other places there is now erecting in passe three miles from paris a large cotton manufactory and several are already erected in america soon after the rejecting the bill for the repealing the test law one of the richest manufacturers in england said in my hearing quote, england sir is not a country for a dissenter to live in we must go to france End quote. these are truths and it is doing justice to both parties to tell them it is chiefly the dissenters that have carried english manufacturers to the height they are now at and the same men have it in their power to carry them away and though those manufacturers would afterwards continue in those places the foreign market will be lost there frequently appear in the london gazette extracts from certain acts to prevent machines and persons as far as they can extend to persons from going out of the country it appears from these that the ill effects of the test laws and church establishment begin to be much suspected but the remedy of force can never supply the remedy of reason in the progress of less than a century all the unrepresented parts of england of all denominations which is at least an hundred times the most numerous may begin to feel the necessity of a constitution and then all those matters will come regularly before them and footnote 
i will here cease the comparison with respect to the principles of the french constitution and conclude this part of the subject with a few observations on the organization of the formal parts of the french and english governments the executive power in each country is in the hands of a person styled the king but the french constitution distinguishes between the king and the sovereign it considers the station of king as official and places sovereignty in the nation the representatives of the nation who compose the national assembly and who are the legislative power originate in and from the people by election as an inherent right of the people in england it is otherwise and this arises from the original establishment of what is called the monarchy for as by the conquest all the rights of the people or the nation were absorbed into the hands of the conqueror and who added the title of king to that of conqueror those same matters which in france are now held as rights in the people or in the nation are held in england as grants from what is called the crown the parliament in england in both its branches were erected by patents from the descendants of the conqueror the house of commons did not originate as a matter of right in the people to delegate or elect but as a grant or boon by the french constitution the nation is always named before the king the third article of the declaration of rights says quote, the nation is essentially the source or fountain of all sovereignty end quote mr burke argues that in england a king is the fountain that he is the fountain of all honor but as this idea is evidently descended from the conquest i shall make no other remark upon it than that it is the nature of conquest to turn everything upside down and as mr burke will not be refused the privilege of speaking twice and as there are but two parts in the figure the fountain and the spout he will be right the second time the french constitution puts the legislative before the executive the law before the king la loi les rois this also is in the natural order of things because laws must have existence before they can have execution a king in france does not in addressing himself to the national assembly say my assembly similar to the phrase used in england of my parliament neither can he use it consistently with the constitution nor could it be admitted there may be propriety in the use of it in england because as is before mentioned both houses of parliament originated from what is called the crown by patent or boon and not from the inherent rights of the people as the national assembly does in france and whose name designates its origin the president of the national assembly does not ask the king to grant to the assembly liberty of speech as is the case with the english house of commons the constitutional dignity of the national assembly cannot debase itself speech is in the first place one of the natural rights of man always retained and with respect to the national assembly the use of it is their duty and the nation is their authority they were elected by the greatest body of men exercising the right of election the european world ever saw they sprung not from the filth of rotten boroughs nor are they the vassal representatives of aristocratical ones feeling the proper dignity of their character they support it their parliamentary language whether for or against a question is free bold and manly and extends to all the parts and circumstances of the case if any matter or subject respecting the executive department or the person who presides in it the king comes before them it is debated on with the spirit of men and in the language of gentlemen and their answer or their address is returned in the same style they stand not aloof with the gaping vacuity of vulgar ignorance nor bend with the cringe of sycophantic insignificance the graceful pride of truth knows no extremes and preserves in every latitude of life the right angled character of men let us now look to the other side of the question in the addresses of the english parliaments to their kings we see neither the intrepid spirit of the old parliaments of france nor the serene dignity of the present national assembly neither do we see in them anything of the style of english manners which border somewhat on bluntness since then they are neither of foreign extraction nor naturally of english production their origin must be sought for elsewhere and that origin is the norman conquest 
they are evidently of the vassalage class of manners and emphatically mark the prostrate distance that exists in no other condition of men than between the conqueror and the conquered that this vassalage idea and style of speaking was not got rid of even at the revolution of sixteen eighty eight is evident from the declaration of parliament to william and mary in these words Quote, we do most humbly and faithfully submit ourselves our heirs and posterities for ever submission is wholly a vassalage term repugnant to the dignity of freedom and an echo of the language used at the conquest as the estimation of all things is given by comparison the revolution of sixteen eighty eight however from circumstances it may have been exalted beyond its value will find its level it is already on the wane eclipsed by the enlarging orb of reason and the luminous revolutions of america and france in less than another century it will go as well as mr burke's labors quote, to the family vault of all the capulets end quote. mankind will then scarcely believe that a country calling itself free would send to holland for a man and clothe him with power on purpose to put themselves in fear of him and give him almost a million sterling a year for leave to submit themselves and their posterity like bondmen and bondwomen for ever but there is a truth that ought to be made known i have had the opportunity of seeing it which is that notwithstanding appearances there is not any description of men that despise monarchy so much as courtiers but they well know that if it were seen by others as it is seen by them the juggle could not be kept up they are in the condition of men who get their living by a show and to whom the folly of that show is so familiar that they ridicule it but were the audience to be made as wise in this respect as themselves there would be an end to the show and the profits with it the difference between a republican and a courtier with respect to monarchy is that the one opposes monarchy believing it to be something and the other laughs at it knowing it to be nothing as i used sometimes to correspond with mr burke believing him then to be a man of sounder principles than his book shows him to be i wrote to him last winter from paris and gave him an account how prosperously matters were going on among other subjects in that letter i referred to the happy situation the national assembly were placed in that they had taken ground on which their moral duty and their political interest were united they have not to hold out a language which they do not themselves believe for the fraudulent purpose of making others believe it their station requires no artifice to support it and can only be maintained by enlightening mankind it is not their interest to cherish ignorance but to dispel it they are not in the case of a ministerial or an opposition party in england who though they are opposed are still united to keep up the common mystery the national assembly must throw open a magazine of light it must show man the proper character of man and the nearer it can bring him to that standard the stronger the national assembly becomes in contemplating the french constitution we see in it a rational order of things the principles harmonize with the forms and both with their origin it may perhaps be said as an excuse for bad forms that they are nothing more than forms but this is a mistake forms grow out of principles and operate to continue the principles they grow from it is impossible to practice a bad form on anything but a bad principle it cannot be engrafted on a good one and wherever the forms in any government are bad it is a certain indication that the principles are bad also i will here finally close this subject i began it by remarking that mr burke had voluntarily declined going into a comparison of the english and french constitutions he apologizes in page two forty one for not doing it by saying that he had not time mr burke's book was upwards of eight months in hand and is extended to a volume of three hundred and sixty-six pages as his omission does injury to his cause his apology makes it worse the men on the english side of the water will begin to consider whether there is not some radical defect in what is called the english constitution that made it necessary for mr burke to suppress the comparison to avoid bringing it into view End of part nine of thirteen.
Section 13 of Rights of Man by Thomas Paine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rights of Man, Part the First, being an answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French Revolution. Part 10 of 13. As Mr. Burke has not written on constitutions, so neither has he written on the French Revolution. He gives no account of its commencement or its progress. He only expresses his wonder. Quote, it looks, says he, to me, as if I were in a great crisis, not of the affairs of France alone, but of all Europe, perhaps of more than Europe. All circumstances taken together, the French Revolution is the most astonishing that has hitherto happened in the world. End quote. As wise men are astonished at foolish things, and other people at wise ones, I know not on which ground to account for Mr. Burke's astonishment. But certain it is that he does not understand the French Revolution. It has apparently burst forth like a creation from a chaos, but it is no more than the consequence of a mental revolution priorly existing in France. The mind of the nation has changed beforehand, and the new order of things has naturally followed the new order of thoughts. I will here, as concisely as I can, trace out the growth of the French Revolution, and mark the circumstances that have contributed to produce it. The despotism of Louis the Fourteenth, united with the gaiety of his court and the gaudy ostentation of his character, had so humbled and at the same time so fascinated the mind of France that the people appeared to have lost all sense of their own dignity in contemplating that of their grand monarch. And the whole reign of Louis the Fifteenth, remarkable only for weakness and effeminacy, made no other alteration than that of spreading a sort of lethargy over the nation, from which it showed no disposition to rise. The only signs which appeared to the spirit of liberty during those periods are to be found in the writings of the French philosophers. Montesquieu, president of the Parliament of Bordeaux, went as far as a writer under a despotic government could well proceed, and being obliged to divide himself between principle and prudence, his mind often appears under a veil, and we ought to give him credit for more than he has expressed. Voltaire, who was both the flatterer and the satirist of despotism, took another line. His forte lay in exposing and ridiculing the superstitions which priestcraft, united with statecraft, had interwoven with governments. It was not from the purity of his principles, or his love of mankind, for satire and philanthropy are not naturally concordant, but from his strong capacity of seeing folly in its true shape, and his irresistible propensity to expose it, that he made those attacks. They were, however, as formidable as if the motives had been virtuous, and he merits the thanks rather than the esteem of mankind. On the contrary, we find in the writings of Rousseau and the Abbé Raynal a loveliness of sentiment in favor of liberty that excites respect and elevates the human faculties. But having raised this animation, they do not direct its operation and leave the mind in love with the object without describing the means of possessing it. The writings of Quinet, Tergo, and the friends of those authors are of the serious kind, but they labored under the same disadvantage with Montesquieu. Their writings abound with moral maxims of government, but are rather directed to economize and reform the administration of the government, rather than the government itself. But all those writings, and many others, had their weight and by the different manner in which they treated the subject of government montesquieu by his judgment and knowledge of laws voltaire by his wit rousseau and reynal by their animation and quinet and Turgot by their moral maxims and systems of economy readers of every class met with something to their taste and a spirit of political inquiry began to diffuse itself through the nation at the time the dispute between england and the then colonies of america broke out in the war which france afterwards engaged in it is very well known that the nation appeared to be beforehand with the french ministry each of them had its view but those views were directed to different objects the one sought liberty and the other retaliation on england the french officers and soldiers who after this went to america were eventually placed in the school of freedom and learned the practice as well as the principle of it by heart 
as it was impossible to separate the military events which took place in america from the principles of the american revolution the publication of those events in france necessarily connected themselves with the principles which produced them many of the facts were in themselves principles such as the declaration of american independence and the treaty of alliance between france and america which recognized the natural rights of man and justified resistance to oppression the then minister of france count vergennes was not the friend of america and it is both justice and gratitude to say that it was the queen of france who gave the cause of america a fashion at the french court count vergennes was the personal and social friend of dr franklin and the doctor had obtained by his sensible gracefulness a sort of influence over him but with respect to principles count vergennes was a despot the situation of dr franklin as minister from america to france should be taken into the chain of circumstances the diplomatic character is of itself the narrowest sphere of society that man can act in it forbids intercourse by the reciprocity of suspicion and a diplomatic is a sort of unconnected atom continually repelling and repelled but this was not the case with dr franklin he was not the diplomatic of a court but of man his character as a philosopher had long been established and his circle of society in france was universal count vergennes resisted for a considerable time the publication in france of american constitutions translated into the french language but even in this he was obliged to give way to public opinion and a sort of propriety in admitting to appear what he had undertaken to defend the american constitutions were to liberty what a grammar is to language they define its parts of speech and practically construct them into syntax the peculiar situation of the then marquis de lafayette is another link in the great chain he served in america as an american officer under a commission of congress and by the universality of his acquaintance was in close friendship with the civil government of america as well as with the military line he spoke the language of the country entered into the discussions on the principles of government and was always a welcome friend at any election when the war closed a vast reinforcement to the cause of liberty spread itself over france by the return of the french officers and soldiers a knowledge of the practice was then joined to the theory and all that was wanting to give it real existence was opportunity man cannot properly speaking make circumstances for his purpose but he always has it in his power to improve them when they occur and this was the case in france monsieur necker was displaced in may seventeen eighty one and by the ill management of the finances afterwards and particularly during the extravagant administration of monsieur calon the revenue of france which was nearly twenty four millions sterling per year was become unequal to the expenditure not because the revenue had decreased but because the expenses had increased and this was a circumstance which the nation laid hold of to bring forward a revolution the english minister mr pitt has frequently alluded to the state of the french finances in his budgets without understanding the subject had the french parliaments been as ready to register edicts for new taxes as the english parliament is to grant them there had been no derangement in the finances nor yet any revolution but this will better explain itself as i proceed ten of thir end of part ten of thirteen Section 14 of Rights of Man by Thomas Paine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rights of Man, Part the First, being an answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French Revolution. Part 11 of 13. It will be necessary here to show how taxes were formerly raised in France the king or rather the court or ministry acting under the use of that name framed the edicts for taxes at their own discretion and sent them to the parliaments to be registered for until they were registered by the parliaments they were not operative disputes had long existed between the court and the parliaments with respect to the extent of the parliament's authority on this head 
the court insisted that the authority of parliaments went no farther than to remonstrate or show reasons against the tax reserving to itself the right of determining whether the reasons were well or ill-founded and in consequence thereof either to withdraw the edict as a matter of choice or to order it to be unregistered as a matter of authority the parliaments on their part insisted that they had not only a right to remonstrate but to reject and on this ground they were always supported by the nation but to return to the order of my narrative monsieur calonne wanted money and as he knew the sturdy disposition of the parliaments with respect to new taxes he ingeniously sought either to approach them by a more gentle means than that of direct authority or to get over their heads by a maneuver and for this purpose he revived the project of assembling a body of men from the several provinces under the style of an assembly of the notables or men of note who met in seventeen eighty seven and who were either to recommend taxes to the parliaments or to act as a parliament themselves an assembly under this name had been called in sixteen seventeen as we are to view this as the first practical step towards the revolution it will be proper to enter into some particulars respecting it the assembly of the notables has in some places been mistaken for the states general but was wholly a different body the states general being always by election the persons who composed the assembly of the notables were all nominated by the king and consisted of one hundred and forty members but as m cologne could not depend upon a majority of this assembly in his favor he very ingeniously arranged them in such a manner as to make forty-four a majority of one hundred and forty to effect this he disposed of them into seven separate committees of twenty members each every general question was to be decided not by a majority of persons but by a majority of committee and as eleven votes would make a majority in a committee and four committees a majority of seven monsieur calonne had good reason to conclude that as forty-four would determine any general question he could not be outvoted but all his plans deceived him and in the event became his overthrow the then marquis de lafayette was placed in the second committee of which the count d'artois was president and as money matters were the object it naturally brought into view every circumstance connected with it m de lafayette made a verbal charge against calonne for selling crown lands to the amount of two millions of livres in a manner that appeared to be unknown to the king the count d'artois as if to intimidate for the bastille was then in being asked the marquis if he would render the charge in writing he replied that he would the count d'artois did not demand it but brought a message from the king to that purport m de lafayette then delivered in his charge in writing to be given to the king undertaking to support it no farther proceedings were had upon this affair but m cologne was soon after dismissed by the king and set off to england as m de lafayette from the experience of what he had seen in america was better acquainted with the science of civil government than the generality of the members who composed the assembly of the notables could then be the brunt of the business fell considerably to his share the plan of those who had a constitution in view was to contend with the court on the ground of taxes and some of them openly professed their object disputes frequently arose between count d'artois and m de lafayette upon various subjects with respect to the arrears already incurred the latter proposed to remedy them by accommodating the expenses to the revenue instead of the revenue to the expenses and as objects of reform he proposed to abolish the bastille and all the state prisons throughout the nation the keeping of which was attended in a debate on this subject with great expense and to suppress letters de cachet but those matters were not then much attended to and with respect to letters de cachet a majority of the nobles appeared to be in favor of them on the subject of supplying the treasury by new taxes the assembly declined taking the matter on themselves concurring in the opinion that they had not authority in a debate on this subject m de lafayette said that raising money by taxes could only be done by a national assembly freely elected by the people and acting as their representatives do you mean said the count d'artois the states general m de lafayette replied that he did will you said the count d'artois sign what you say to be given to the king 
the others replied that he would not only do this but that he would go farther and say that the effectual mode would be for the king to agree to the establishment of a constitution as was failed that of getting the assembly to act as a parliament the other came into view that of recommending on this subject the assembly agreed to recommend two new taxes to be unregistered by the parliament the one a stamp tax and the other a territorial tax or a sort of land tax the two have been estimated at about five million sterling per annum we have now to turn our attention to the parliaments on whom the business was again devolving the archbishop of thoulouse since archbishop of sens and now a cardinal was appointed to the administration of the finances soon after the dismission of cologne he was also made prime minister an office that did not always exist in france when this office did not exist the chief of each of the principal departments transacted business immediately with the king but when a prime minister was appointed they did business only with him the archbishop arrived to more state authority than any minister since the duc de choisiel and the nation was strongly disposed in his favor but by a line of conduct scarcely to be accounted for he perverted every opportunity turned out a despot and sunk into disgrace and a cardinal the assembly of the notables having broken up the minister sent the edicts for the two new taxes recommended by the assembly to the parliaments to be unregistered they of course came first before the parliament of paris who returned for answer quote, that with such a revenue as the nation then supported the name of taxes ought not to be mentioned but for the purpose of reducing them end quote, and threw both the edicts out on this refusal the parliament was ordered to versailles where in the usual form the king held what under the old government was called a bed of justice and the two edicts were unregistered in presence of the parliament by an order of state in the manner mentioned earlier on this the parliament immediately returned to paris renewed their session in form and ordered the enregistering to be struck out declaring that everything done at versailles was illegal all the members of the parliament were then served with lettres de cachet and exiled to troyes but as they continued as inflexible in exile as before and as vengeance did not supply the place of taxes they were after a short time recalled to paris the edicts were again tendered to them and the count d'artois undertook to act as representative of the king for this purpose he came from versailles to paris in a train of procession and the parliament were assembled to receive him but show and parade had lost their influence in france and whatever ideas of importance he might set off with he had to return with those of mortification and disappointment on alighting from his carriage to ascend the steps of the parliament house the crowd which was numerously collected threw out trite expressions saying quote, this is monsieur d'artois who wants more of our money to spend End quote. the marked disapprobation which he saw impressed him with apprehensions and the word aux armes to arms was given out by the officer of the guard who attended him it was so loudly vociferated that it echoed through the avenues of the house and produced a temporary confusion i was then standing in one of the apartments through which he had to pass and could not avoid reflecting how wretched was the condition of a disrespected man he endeavored to impress the parliament by great words and opened his authority by saying quote, the king our lord and master End quote. the parliament received him very coolly and with their usual determination not to register the taxes and in this manner the interview ended after this a new subject took place in the various debates and contests which arose between the court and the parliaments on the subject of taxes the parliament of paris at last declared that although it had been customary for parliaments to enregister edicts for taxes as a matter of convenience the right belonged only to the states general and that therefore the parliament could no longer with propriety continue to debate on what it had not authority to act the king after this came to paris and held a meeting with the parliament in which he continued from ten in the morning till about six in the evening and in a manner that appeared to proceed from him as if unconsulted upon with the cabinet or ministry gave his word to the parliament that the states general should be convened but after this another scene arose on a ground different from all the former 
the minister and the cabinet were averse to calling the states general they well knew that if the states general were assembled themselves must fall and as the king had not mentioned any time they hit on a project calculated to elude without appearing to oppose for this purpose the court set about making a sort of constitution itself it was principally the work of m lamoignon the keeper of the seals who afterwards shot himself this new arrangement consisted in establishing a body under the name of a corps plenière or full court in which were invested all the powers that the government might have occasion to make use of the persons composing this court were to be nominated by the king the contended right of taxation was given up on the part of the king and a new criminal code of laws and laws proceeding was substituted in the room of the former the thing in many points contained better principles than those upon which the government had hitherto been administered but with respect to the court plenière it was no other than a medium through which despotism was to pass without appearing to act directly from itself the cabinet had high expectations from their new contrivance the people who were to compose the corps plenière were already nominated and as it was necessary to carry a fair appearance many of the best characters in the nation were appointed among the number it was to commence on may eighth seventeen eighty eight but an opposition arose to it on two grounds the one as a principle the other as a form on the ground of principle it was contended that government had not a right to alter itself and that if the practice was once admitted it would grow into a principle and be made a precedent for any future alterations that government might wish to establish that the right of altering the government was a national right and not a right of government and on the ground of form it was contended that the corps plenière was nothing more than a larger cabinet the then duc de la rochefoucauld luxembourg de noels and many others refused to accept the nomination and strenuously opposed the whole plan when the edict for establishing this new court was sent to parliaments to be unregistered and put into execution they resisted also the parliament of paris not only refused but denied the authority and the contest renewed itself between the parliament and the cabinet more strongly than ever while the parliament were sitting in debate on this subject the ministry ordered a regiment of soldiers to surround the house and form a blockade the members sent out for beds and provisions and lived as in a besieged citadel and as this had no effect the commanding officer was ordered to enter the parliament house and seize them which he did and some of the principal members were shut up in different prisons about the same time a deputation of persons arrived from the province of brittany to remonstrate against the establishment of the corps plenière and those the archbishop sent to the bastille but the spirit of the nation was not to be overcome and it was so fully sensible of the strong ground it had taken that of withholding taxes that it contented itself with keeping up a sort of quiet resistance which effectually overthrew all the plans at that time formed against it the project of the corps plenière was at last obliged to be given up and the prime minister not long afterwards followed its fate and m neckar was recalled into office the attempt to establish the corps plenière had an effect upon the nation which itself did not perceive it was a sort of new form of government that insensibly served to put the old one out of sight and to unhinge it from the superstitious authority of antiquity it was government dethroning government and the old one by attempting to make a new one made a chasm end of part 11 of 13 section 15 of rights of man by thomas paine this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana rights of man part the first being an answer to mr burke's attack on the french revolution part twelve of thirteen the failure of this scheme renewed the subject of convening the states general and this gave rise to a new series of politics there was no settled form for convening the states general all that it positively meant was a deputation from what was then called the clergy the noblesse and the commons but their members or their proportions had not always been the same 
they had been convened only on extraordinary occasions the last of which was in 1614 their numbers were then in equal proportions and they voted by orders it could not well escape the sagacity of m Nacar that the mode of 1614 would answer neither the purpose of the then government nor of the nation as matters were at that time circumstance it would have been too contentious to agree upon anything the debates would have been endless upon privileges and exemptions in which neither the wants of the government nor the wishes of the nation for a constitution would have been attended to but as he did not choose to take the decision upon himself he summoned again the assembly of the notables and referred it to them this body was in general interested in the decision being chiefly of aristocracy and high-paid clergy and they decided in favor of the mode of sixteen fourteen this decision was against the sense of the nation and also against the wishes of the court for the aristocracy opposed itself to both and contended for privileges independent of either the subject was then taken up by the parliament who recommended that the number of the commons should be equal to the other two and they should all sit in one house and vote in one body the number finally determined on was one thousand two hundred six hundred to be chosen by the commons and this was less than their proportion ought to have been when their worth and consequence is considered on a national scale three hundred by the clergy and three hundred by the aristocracy but with respect to the mode of assembling themselves whether together or apart or the manner in which they should vote those matters were referred footnote mr burke and i must take the liberty of telling him that he is very unacquainted with french affairs speaking upon this subject says quote, the first thing that struck me in calling the states general was a great departure from the ancient course and he soon afterwards says from the moment i read the list i saw distinctly and very nearly as it happened all that was to follow End quote. mr burke certainly did not see all that was to follow i endeavored to impress him as well before as after the states-general met that there would be a revolution but was not able to make him see it neither would he believe it how then he could distinctly see all the parts when the whole was out of sight is beyond my comprehension and with respect to the quote, departure from the ancient course End quote. besides the natural weakness of the remark it shows that he is unacquainted with circumstances the departure was necessary from the experience had upon it that the ancient course was a bad one the states general of sixteen fourteen were called at the commencement of the civil war in the minority of louis the thirteenth but by the class of arranging them by orders they increased the confusion they were called to compose the author of l'intrigue du cabinet intrigue of the cabinet who wrote before any revolution was thought of in france speaking of the states general of sixteen fourteen says quote, they held the public in suspense five months and by the questions agitated therein and the heat with which they were put it appears that the great les grandes thought more to satisfy their particular passions than to procure the goods of the nation and the whole time passed away in altercations ceremonies and parade from l'intrigue du cabinet volume one page three twenty nine and footnote the election that followed was not a contested election but an animated one the candidates were not men but principals societies were formed in paris and committees of correspondence and communication established throughout the nation for the purpose of enlightening the people and explaining to them the principles of civil government and so orderly was the election conducted that it did not give rise even to the rumor of tumult the states general were to meet at versailles in april seventeen eighty nine but did not assemble till may they situated themselves in three separate chambers or rather the clergy and the aristocracy withdrew each into a separate chamber the majority of the aristocracy claimed what they called the privilege of voting as a separate body and of giving their consent or their negative in that manner and many of the bishops and the high beneficed clergy claimed the same privilege on the part of their order 
the tiers etat as they were then called disowned any knowledge of artificial orders and artificial privileges and they were not only resolute on this point but somewhat disdainful they began to consider the aristocracy as a kind of fungus growing out of the corruption of society that could not be admitted even as a branch of it and from the disposition the aristocracy had shown by upholding lettres de cachet and in sundry other instances it was manifest that no constitution could be formed by admitting men in any other character than as national men after various altercations on this head the tiers etat or commons as they were then called declared themselves on a motion made for the purpose by the abbe Sies, quote, the representative of the nation and that the two orders could be considered but as deputies of corporations and could only have a deliberate voice when they assembled in a national character with the national representatives End quote. this proceeding extinguished the style of etat general or states general and erected it into the style it now bears that of l'assemblée nationale or national assembly this motion was not made in a precipitate manner it was the result of cool deliberation and concerned between the national representatives and the patriotic members of the two chambers who saw into the folly mischief and injustice of artificial privileged distinctions it was become evident that no constitution worthy of being called by that name could be established on anything less than a national ground the aristocracy had hitherto opposed the despotism of the court and affected the language of patriotism but it opposed it as its rival as the english barons opposed king john and now opposed the nation from the same motives on carrying this motion the national representatives as had been concerted sent an invitation to the two chambers to unite with them in a national character and proceed to business the majority of the clergy chiefly of the parish priests withdrew from the clerical chamber and joined the nation and forty-five from the other chamber joined in like manner there is a sort of secret history belonging to this last circumstance which is necessary to its explanation it was not judged prudent that all the patriotic members of the chamber styling itself de nobles should quit it at once and in consequence of this arrangement they drew off by degrees always leaving some as well to reason the case as to watch the suspected in a little time the number increased from forty-five to eighty and soon after to a greater number which with the majority of the clergy and the whole of the national representatives put the malcontents in a very diminutive condition the king who very different from the general class called by that name is a man of a good heart showed himself disposed to recommend a union of the three chambers on the ground the national assembly had taken but the malcontents exerted themselves to prevent it and began now to have another project in view their numbers consisted of a majority of the aristocratical chamber and the minority of the clerical chamber chiefly of bishops and high beneficed clergy and these men were determined to put everything to issue as well by strength as by stratagem they had no objection to a constitution but it must be such a one as themselves should dictate and suited to their own views and particular situations on the other hand the nation disowned knowing anything of them but as citizens and was determined to shut out all such upstart pretensions the more aristocracy appeared the more it was despised there was a visible imbecility and want of intellects in the majority a sort of je ne sais quoi that while it affected to be more than citizen was less than man it lost ground from contempt more than from hatred and was rather jeered at as an ass than dreaded as a lion this is the general character of aristocracy or what are called nobles or nobility or rather no ability in all countries the plan of the malcontents consisted now of two things either to deliberate the vote by chambers or orders more especially on all questions respecting a constitution by which the aristocratical chamber would have had a negative on any article of the constitution or in case they could not accomplish this object to overthrow the national assembly entirely 
to effect one or other of these objects they began to cultivate a friendship with the despotism they had hitherto attempted to rival and the count d'artois became their chief the king who has since declared himself deceived into their measures held according to the old form a bed of justice in which he accorded to the deliberation and vote par tete by head upon several subjects but reserved the deliberation and vote upon all questions respecting the constitution to the three chambers separately this declaration of the king was made against the advice of monsieur necker who now began to perceive that he was growing out of fashion at court and that another minister was in contemplation as the form of sitting in separate chambers was yet apparently kept up though essentially destroyed the national representatives immediately after this declaration of the king resorted to their own chambers to consult on a protest against it and the minority of the chamber calling itself the nobles who had joined the national cause retired to a private house to consult in like manner the malcontents had by this time concerted their measures with the court which the count d'artois undertook to conduct and as they saw from the discontent which the declaration excited and the opposition making against it that they could not obtain a control over the intended constitution by a separate vote they prepared themselves for their final object that of conspiring against the national assembly and overthrowing it the next morning the door of the chamber of the national assembly was shut against them and guarded by troops and the members were refused admittance on this they withdrew to a tennis ground in the neighborhood of versailles as the most convenient place they could find and after renewing their session took an oath never to separate from each other under any circumstance whatever death excepted until they had established a constitution as the experiment of shutting up the house had no other effect than that of producing a closer connection in the members it was opened again the next day and the public business recommenced in the usual place end of part twelve of thirteen section sixteen of rights of man by thomas paine this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana rights of man part the first being an answer to mr burke's attack on the french revolution part thirteen of thirteen we are now to have in view the forming of the new ministry which was to accomplish the overthrow of the national assembly but as force would be necessary orders were issued to assemble thirty thousand troops the command of which was given to broglio one of the intended new ministry who was recalled from the country for this purpose but as some management was necessary to keep this plan concealed till the moment it should be ready for execution it is to this policy that a declaration made by count d'artois must be attributed and which is here proper to be introduced effectually accomplished it could not but occur while the malcontents continued to resort to their chambers separate from the national assembly more jealousy would be excited than if they were mixed with it and that the plot might be suspected but as they had taken their ground and now wanted a pretense for quitting it it was necessary that one should be devised this was effectually accomplished by a declaration made by the count d'artois quote, that if they took not a part in the national assembly the life of the king would be endangered end quote. on which they quitted their chambers and mixed with the assembly in one body at the time this declaration was made it was generally treated as a piece of absurdity in count d'artois calculated merely to relieve the outstanding members of the two chambers from the diminutive situation they were put in and if nothing more had followed this conclusion would have been good but as things best explain themselves by this apparent union was only a cover to the machinations which were secretly going on and the declaration accommodated itself to answer that purpose in a little time the national assembly found itself surrounded by troops and thousands more were daily arriving on this a very strong declaration was made by the national assembly to the king remonstrating on the impropriety of the measure and demanding the reason the king who was not in the secret of this business as himself afterward declared gave substantially for answer that he had no other object in view than to preserve the public tranquillity which appeared to be much disturbed 
but in a few days from this time the plot unraveled itself monsieur necker and the ministry were displaced and a new one formed of the enemies of the revolution and broglio with between twenty five and thirty thousand foreign troops was arrived to support them the mask was now thrown off the matters were come to a crisis the event was that in the space of three days the new ministry and their abettors found it prudent to fly the nation the bastille was taken and broglio and his foreign troops dispersed as is already related in the former part of this work there are some curious circumstances in the history of this short-lived ministry and this short-lived attempt at a counter-revolution the palace of versailles where the court was sitting was not more than four hundred yards distant from the hall where the national assembly was sitting the two places were at this moment like the separate headquarters of two combatant armies yet the court was as perfectly ignorant of the information which had arrived from paris to the national assembly as if it had resided at an hundred miles distance the then marquis de lafayette who as has been already mentioned was chosen to preside in the national assembly on this particular occasion named by order of the assembly three successive deputations to the king on the day and up to the evening on which the bastille was taken to inform and confer with him on the state of affairs but the ministry who knew not so much as that it was attacked precluded all communication and were solacing themselves how dexterously they had succeeded but in a few hours the accounts arrived so thick and fast that they had to start from their desks and run some set off in one disguise and some in another and none in their own character their anxiety now was to outride the news lest they should be stopped which though it flew fast flew not so fast as themselves it is worth remarking that the national assembly neither pursued those fugitive conspirators nor took any notice of them nor sought to retaliate in any shape whatever occupied with establishing a constitution founded on the rights of man and the authority of the people the only authority on which government has a right to exist in any country the national assembly felt none of those mean passions which mark the character of impertinent governments founding themselves on their own authority or on the absurdity of hereditary succession it is the faculty of the human mind to become what it contemplates and to act in unison with its object the conspiracy being thus dispersed one of the first works of the national assembly instead of vindictive proclamations as has been the case with other governments was to publish a declaration of the rights of man as the basis on which the new constitution was to be built and which is here subjoined end of part thirteen of thirteen section seventeen of rights of man by thomas paine this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana declaration of the rights of man and of citizens by the national assembly of france the representatives of the people of france formed into a national assembly considering that ignorance neglect or contempt of human rights are the sole causes of public misfortunes and corruptions of government have resolved to set forth in a solemn declaration these natural imprescriptible and inalienable rights that this declaration being constantly present in the minds of the members of the body social they may be forever kept attentive to their rights and their duties that the acts of the legislative and executive powers of government being capable of being every moment compared with the end of political institutions may be more respected and also that the future claims of the citizens being directed by simple and incontestable principles may always tend to the maintenance of the constitution and the general happiness for these reasons the national assembly doth recognize and declare in the presence of the supreme being and with the hope of his blessing and favor the following sacred rights of men and of citizens One men are born and always continue free and equal in respect of their rights civil distinctions therefore can be founded only on public utility two the end of all political associations is the preservation of the natural and imprescriptible rights of man and these rights are liberty property 
security and resistance of oppression three the nation is essentially the source of all sovereignty nor can any individual or any body of men be entitled to any authority which is not expressly derived from it four political liberty consists in the power of doing whatever does not injure another the exercise of the natural rights of every man has no other limits than those which are necessary to secure to every other man the free exercise of the same rights and these limits are determinable only by the law five the law ought to prohibit only actions hurtful to society what is not prohibited by the law should not be hindered nor should any one be compelled to that which the law does not require six the law is an expression of the will of the community all citizens have a right to concur either personally or by their representatives in its formation it should be the same to all whether it protects or punishes and all being equal in its sight are equally eligible to all honors places and employments according to their different abilities without any other distinction than that created by their virtues and talents seven no man should be accused arrested or held in confinement except in cases determined by the law and according to the forms which it has prescribed all who promote solicit execute or cause to be executed arbitrary orders ought to be punished and every citizen called upon or apprehended by virtue of the law ought immediately to obey and renders himself culpable by resistance eight the law ought to impose no other penalties but such as are absolutely and evidently necessary and no one ought to be punished but in virtue of a law promulgated before the offense and legally applied nine every man being presumed innocent till he has been convicted whenever his detention becomes indispensable all rigor to him more than is necessary to secure his person ought to be provided against by the law ten no man ought to be molested on account of his opinions not even on account of his religious opinions provided his avowal of them does not disturb the public order established by the law eleven the unrestrained communication of thoughts and opinions being one of the most precious rights of man every citizen may speak write and publish freely provided he is responsible for the abuse of this liberty in cases determined by the law twelve a public force being necessary to give security to the rights of man and of citizens that force is instituted for the benefit of the community and not for the particular benefit of the persons to whom it is entrusted thirteen a common contribution being necessary for the support of the public force and for defraying the other expenses of government it ought to be divided equally among the members of the community according to their abilities fourteen every citizen has a right either by himself or his representative to a free voice in determining the necessity of public contributions the appropriation of them and their amount mode of assessment and duration fifteen every community has a right to demand of all its agents an account of their conduct sixteen every community in which a separation of powers and a security of rights is not provided for wants a constitution seventeen the right to property being inviolable and sacred no one ought to be deprived of it except in cases of evident public necessity legally ascertained and on condition of a previous just indemnity end of the declaration of the rights of man and of citizens by the national assembly of france section eighteen of rights of man by thomas paine this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Observations on the Declaration of Rights The first three articles comprehend in general terms the whole of a Declaration of Rights. All the succeeding articles either originate from them or follow as elucidations. 
the fourth fifth and sixth define more particularly what is only generally expressed in the first second and third the seventh eighth ninth tenth and eleventh articles are declaratory of principles upon which laws shall be constructed conformable to rights already declared but it is questioned by some very good people in france as well as in other countries whether the tenth article sufficiently guarantees the right it is intended to accord with besides which it takes off from the divine dignity of religion and weakens its operative force upon the mind to make it a subject of human laws it then presents itself to man like light intercepted by a cloudy medium in which the source of it is obscured from his sight and he sees nothing to reverence in the dusky ray footnote there is a single idea which if it strikes rightly upon the mind either in a legal or a religious sense will prevent any man or any body of men or any government from going wrong on the subject of religion which is that before any human institutions of government were known in the world there existed if i may so express it a compact between god and man from the beginning of time and that as the relation and condition which man in his individual person stands in towards his maker cannot be changed by any human laws or human authority that religious devotion which is a part of this compact cannot so much as be made a subject of human laws and that all laws must conform themselves to this prior existing compact and not assume to make the compact conform to the laws which besides being human are subsequent thereto the first act of man when he looked around and saw himself a creature which he did not make and a world furnished for his reception must have been devotion and devotion must ever continue sacred to every individual man as it appears right to him and governments do mischief by interfering and footnote the remaining articles beginning with the twelfth are substantially contained in the principles of the preceding articles but in the particular situation in which france then was having to undo what was wrong as well as to set up what was right it was proper to be more particular than what in another condition of things would be necessary while the declaration of rights was before the national assembly some of its members remarked that if a declaration of rights were published it should be accompanied by a declaration of duties the observation discovered a mind that reflected and it only erred by not reflecting far enough a declaration of rights is by reciprocity a declaration of duties also whatever is my right as a man is also the right of another and it becomes my duty to guarantee as well as to possess the three first articles are the base of liberty as well individual as national nor can any country be called free whose government does not take its beginning from the principles they contain and continue to preserve them pure and the whole of the declaration of rights is of more value to the world and will do more good than all the laws and statutes that have yet been promulgated in the declaratory exordium which prefaces the declaration of rights we see the solemn and majestic spectacle of a nation opening its commission under the auspices of its creator to establish a government a scene so new and so transcendentally unequaled by anything in the european world that the name of a revolution is diminutive of its character and it rises into a regeneration of man what are the present governments of europe but a scene of iniquity and oppression what is that of england do not its own inhabitants say it is a market where every man has his price and where corruption is common traffic at the expense of a deluded people no wonder then that the french revolution is traduced had it confined itself merely to the destruction of flagrant despotism perhaps mr burke and some others had been silent their cry now is it has gone too far that is it has gone too far for them it stares corruption in the face and the venal tribe are all armed their fear discovers itself in their outrage and they are but publishing the groans of a wounded vice but from such opposition the french revolution instead of suffering receives an homage the more it is struck the more sparks it will emit and the fear is it will not be struck enough 
it has nothing to dread from attacks truth has given it an establishment and time will record it with a name as lasting as his own having now traced the progress of the french revolution through most of its principal stages from its commencement to the taking of the bastille and its establishment by the declaration of rights i will close the subject with the energetic apostrophe of m de lafayette Quote, may this great monument raised to liberty serve as a lesson to the oppressor and an example to the oppressed End quote. End of observations on the declaration of rights section nineteen of the rights of man by thomas paine this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana rights of man part the first being an answer to mr burke's attack on the french revolution part one of three of the miscellaneous chapter to prevent interrupting the argument in the preceding part of this work or the narrative that follows it i reserved some observations to be thrown together in a miscellaneous chapter by which variety might not be censured for confusion mr burke's book is all miscellany his intention was to make an attack on the french revolution but instead of proceeding with an orderly arrangement he has stormed it with a mob of ideas tumbling over and destroying one another but this confusion and contradiction in mr burke's book is easily accounted for when a man in a wrong cause attempts to steer his course by anything else than some polar truth or principle he is sure to be lost it is beyond the compass of his capacity to keep all the parts of an argument together and make them unite in one issue by any other means than having this guide always in view neither memory nor invention will supply the want of it the former fails him and the latter betrays him notwithstanding the nonsense for it deserves no better name that mr burke has asserted about hereditary rights and hereditary succession and that a nation has not a right to form a government of itself it happened to fall in his way to give some account of what government is government says he is a contrivance of human wisdom admitting that governments is a contrivance of human wisdom it must necessarily follow that hereditary succession and hereditary rights as they are called can make no part of it because it is impossible to make wisdom hereditary and on the other hand that cannot be a wise contrivance which in its operation may commit the government of a nation to the wisdom of an idiot the ground which mr burke now takes is fatal to every part of his cause the argument changes from hereditary rights to hereditary wisdom and the question is who is the wisest man he must now show that every one in the line of hereditary succession was a solomon or his title is not good to be a king what a stroke has mr burke now made to use a sailor's phrase he has swabbed the deck and scarcely left a name legible in the list of kings and he has mowed down and thinned the house of peers with a scythe as formidable as death and time but mr burke appears to have been aware of this retort and he has taken care to guard against it by making government to be not only a contrivance of human wisdom but a monopoly of wisdom he puts the nation as fools on one side and places his government of wisdom all wise men of gotham on the other side and he then proclaims and says that quote, men have a right that their wants should be provided for by this wisdom End quote. having thus made proclamation he next proceeds to explain to them what their wants are and also what their rights are in this he has succeeded dexterously for he makes their wants to be a want of wisdom but as this is cold comfort he then informs them that they have a right not to any of the wisdom but to be governed by it and in order to impress them with a solemn reverence for this monopoly government of wisdom and of its vast capacity for all purposes possible or impossible right or wrong he proceeds with astrological mysterious importance to tell to them its powers in these words Quote, 
the rights of men in government are their advantages and these are often in balance between differences of goods and in compromises sometimes between good and evil and sometimes between evil and evil political reason is a computing principle adding subtracting multiplying and dividing morally and not metaphysically or mathematically true moral denominations End quote as the wondering audience whom mr burke supposes himself talking to may not understand all this learned jargon i will undertake to be its interpreter the meaning then good people of all this is that government is governed by no principle whatever that it can make evil good or good evil just as it pleases in short that government is arbitrary power but there are some things which mr burke has forgotten first he has not shown where the wisdom originally came from and secondly he has not shown by what authority it first began to act in the manner he introduces the matter it is either government stealing wisdom or wisdom stealing government it is without an origin and its powers without authority in short it is usurpation whether it be from a sense of shame or from a consciousness of some radical defect in a government necessary to be kept out of sight or from both or from any other cause i undertake not to determine but so it is that a monarchical reasoner never traces government to its source or from its source it is one of the shibboleths by which he may be known a thousand years hence those who shall live in america or france will look back with contemplative pride on the origin of their government and say this was the work of our glorious ancestors but what can a monarchical talker say what has he to exult in alas he has nothing a certain something forbids him to look back to the beginning lest some robber or some robin hood should rise from the long obscurity of time and say i am the origin hard as mr burke labored at the regency bill and hereditary succession two years ago and much as he dived for precedence he still had not boldness enough to bring up william of normandy and say there is the head of the list there is the fountain of honor the son of a prostitute and the plunderer of the english nation the opinions of men with respect to government are changing fast in all countries the revolutions of america and france have thrown a beam of light over the world which reaches into man the enormous expense of governments has provoked people to think by making them feel and when once the veil begins to rend it admits not of repair ignorance is of a peculiar nature once dispelled it is impossible to re-establish it it is not originally a thing of itself but is only the absence of knowledge and though man may be kept ignorant he cannot be made ignorant the mind in discovering truth acts in the same manner as it acts through the eye in discovering objects when once any object has been seen it is impossible to put the mind back to the same condition it was in before it saw it those who talk of a counter-revolution in france show how little they understand of man there does not exist in the compass of language an arrangement of words to express so much as the means of effecting a counter-revolution the means must be an obliteration of knowledge and it has never yet been discovered how to make man unknow his knowledge or unthink his thoughts mr burke is laboring in vain to stop the progress of knowledge and it comes with the worst grace from him as there is a certain transaction known in the city which renders him suspected of being a pensioner in a fictitious name this may account for some strange doctrine he has advanced in his book which though he points it at the revolution society is effectually directed against the whole nation Quote, the king of england says he holds his crown for it does not belong to the nation according to mr burke in contempt of the choice of the revolution society who have not a single vote for a king among them either individually or collectively and his majesty's heirs each in their time and order will come to the crown with the same contempt of their choice with which his majesty has succeeded to that which he now wears End quote as to who is king in england or elsewhere or whether there is any king at all or whether the people choose a cherokee chief or a hessian hussar for a king it is not a matter that i trouble myself about be that to themselves but with respect to the doctrine so far as it relates to the rights of man and nations it is as abominable as anything ever uttered in the most enslaved country under heaven 
whether it sounds worse to my ear by not being accustomed to hear such despotism than what it does to another person i am not so well a judge of but of its abominable principle i am at no loss to judge it is not the revolution society that mr burke means it is the nation as well in its original as in its representative character and he has taken care to make himself understood by saying that they have not a vote either collectively or individually the revolution society is composed of citizens of all denominations and of members of both the houses of parliament and consequently if there is not a right to a vote in any of the characters there can be no right to any either in the nation or in its parliament this ought to be a caution to every country how to import foreign families to be kings it is somewhat curious to observe that although the people of england had been in the habit of talking about kings it is always a foreign house of kings hating foreigners yet governed by them it is now the house of brunswick one of the petty tribes of germany it has hitherto been the practice of the english parliaments to regulate what was called the succession taking it for granted that the nation then continued to accord to the form of annexing a monarchical branch of its government for without this the parliament could not have had authority to have sent either to holland or to hanover or to impose a king upon the nation against its will and this must be the utmost limit to which parliament can go upon this case but the right of the nation goes to the whole case because it has the right of changing its whole form of government the right of a parliament is only a right in trust a right by delegation and that but for a very small part of the nation and one of its houses has not even this but the right of the nation is an original right as universal as taxation the nation is the paymaster of everything and everything must conform to its general will i remember taking notice of a speech in what is called the english house of peers by the then earl of shelburne and i think it was at the time he was minister which is applicable to this case i do not directly charge my memory with every particular but the words and the purport as nearly as i remember were these Quote, that the form of a government was a matter wholly at the will of the nation at all times that if it chose a monarchical form it had a right to have it so and if it afterwards chose to be a republic it had a right to be a republic and to say to the king quote, we have no longer any occasion for you End quote when mr burke says that quote, his majesty's heirs and successors each in their time and order will come to the crown with the same content of their choice with which his majesty had succeeded to that he wears end quote, it is saying too much even to the humblest individual in the country part of his daily labor goes toward making up the millions sterling a year which the country gives the person it styles a king government with insolence is despotism but when contempt is added it becomes worse and to pay for contempt is the excess of slavery this species of government comes from germany and reminds me of what one of the brunswick soldiers told me who was taken prisoner by the americans in the late war Quote, ah said he america is a fine free country it is worth the people's fighting for i know the difference by knowing my own in my country if the prince says eat straw we eat straw End quote. god help that country thought i be it england or elsewhere whose liberties are to be protected by german principles of government and princes of brunswick as mr burke sometimes speaks of england sometimes of france and sometimes of the world and of government in general it is difficult to answer his book without apparently meeting him on the same ground although principles of government are general subjects it is next to impossible in many cases to separate them from the idea of place and circumstance and the more so when circumstances are put for arguments which is frequently the case with mr burke in the former part of his book addressing himself to the people of france he says quote, no experience has taught us meaning the english that in any other course or method than that of a hereditary crown can our liberties be regularly perpetuated and preserved sacred as our hereditary right End quote. i ask mr burke who is to take them away monsieur de lafayette in speaking to france says 
quote, for a nation to be free, it is sufficient that she wills it, end quote. But Mr. Burke represents England as wanting capacity to take care of herself, and that its liberties must be taken care of by a king holding it in contempt. If England is sunk to this, it is preparing itself to eat straw, as in Hanover or in Brunswick. But besides the folly of the declaration, it happens that the facts are all against Mr. Burke. It was by the government being hereditary that the liberties of the people were endangered. Charles I and James II are instances of this truth, yet neither of them went so far as to hold the nation in contempt. It is sometimes of advantage to the people of one country to hear what those of other countries have to say respecting it. It is possible that the people of France may learn something from Mr. Burke's book, and that the people of England may also learn something from the answers it will occasion. When nations fall out about freedom, a wide field of debate is opened. The argument commences with the rights of war without its evils, and as knowledge is the object contended for, the party that sustains the defeat obtains the prize. Mr. Burke talks about what he calls an hereditary crown, as if it were some product of nature, or as if, like time, it had a power to operate, not only independently, but in spite of man, or as if it were a thing or a subject universally consented to. Alas, it has none of those properties, but is the reverse of them all it is a thing in imagination the propriety of which is more than doubted and the legality of which in a few years will be denied but to arrange this matter in a clearer view than what general expressions can convey it will be necessary to state the distinct heads under which what is called an hereditary crown or more properly speaking an hereditary succession to the government of a nation can be considered which are first the right of a particular family to establish itself secondly the right of a nation to establish a particular family with respect to the first of these heads that of a family establishing itself with hereditary powers on its own authority and independent of the consent of a nation all men will concur in calling it despotism and it would be trespassing on their understanding to attempt to prove it but the second head, that of a nation establishing a particular family with hereditary powers, does not present itself as despotism on the first reflection, but if men will permit it a second reflection to take place, and carry that reflection forward but one remove out of their own persons to that of their offspring, they will then see that hereditary succession becomes in its consequences the same despotism to others which they reprobated for themselves it operates to preclude the consent of the succeeding generations and the preclusion of consent is despotism when the person who at any time shall be in possession of a government or those who stand in succession to him shall say to the nation i hold this power in contempt of you it signifies not on what authority he pretends to say it it is no relief but an aggravation to a person in slavery to reflect that he was sold by his parent and as that which heightens the criminality of an act cannot be produced to prove the legality of it hereditary succession cannot be established as a legal thing in order to arrive at a more perfect decision on this head it will be proper to consider the generation which undertakes to establish a family with hereditary powers apart and separate from the generations which are to follow and also to consider the character in which the first generation acts with respect to succeeding generations. End of part one of three of the miscellaneous chapter. Section twenty of Rights of Man by Thomas Paine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rights of Man, Part the First, being an answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French Revolution, Part Two of Three of the Miscellaneous Chapter. 
the generation which first selects a person and puts him at the head of its government either with the title of king or any other distinction acts on its own choice be it wise or foolish as a free agent for itself the person so set up is not hereditary but selected and appointed and the generation who sets him up does not live under a hereditary government but under a government of its own choice and establishment were the generation who sets him up and the person so set up to live forever it never could become hereditary succession and of consequence hereditary succession can only follow on the death of the first parties as therefore hereditary succession is out of the question with respect to the first generation we have now to consider the character in which that generation acts with respect to the commencing generation and to all succeeding ones it assumes a character to which it has neither right nor title it changes itself from a legislator to a testator and affects to make its will which is to have operation after the demise of the makers to bequeath the government and it not only attempts to bequeath but to establish on the succeeding generation a new and different form of government under which itself lived itself as already observed lived not under a hereditary government but under a government of its own choice and establishment and it now attempts by virtue of a will and testament and which it has not authority to make to take from the commencing generation and all future ones the rights and free agency by which itself acted but exclusive of the right which any generation has to act collectively as a testator the objects to which it applies itself in this case are not within the compass of any law or of any will or testament the rights of men in society are neither divisible or transferable nor annihilable but are descendable only and it is not in the power of any generation to intercept finally and cut off the descent if the present generation or any other are disposed to be slaves it does not lessen the right of the succeeding generation to be free wrongs cannot have a legal descent when mr burke attempts to maintain that the english nation did at the revolution of sixteen eighty eight most solemnly renounce and abdicate their rights for themselves and for all their posterity for ever he speaks a language that merits no reply and which can only excite contempt for his prostitute principles or pity for his ignorance in whatever light hereditary succession as growing out of the will and testament of some former generation presents itself it is an absurdity it cannot make a will to take from b the property of b and give it to c yet this is the manner in which what is called hereditary succession by law operates a certain former generation made a will to take away the rights of the commencing generation and all future ones and convey those rights to a third person who afterwards comes forward and tells them in mr burke's language that they have no rights that their rights are already bequeathed to him and that he will govern in contempt of them from such principles and such ignorance good lord deliver the world but after all what is this metaphor called a crown or rather what is monarchy is it a thing or is it a name or is it a fraud is it a contrivance of human wisdom or of human craft to obtain money from a nation under specious pretenses is it a thing necessary to a nation if it is in what does that necessity consist what service does it perform what is its business and what are its merits does its virtue consist in the metaphor or in the man doth the goldsmith that makes the crown make the virtue also does it operate like fortunatus's wishing cap or harlequin's wooden sword doth it make a man a conjurer in fine what is it it appears to be something going much out of fashion falling into ridicule and rejected in some countries both as unnecessary and expensive in america it is considered as an absurdity and in france it has so far declined that the goodness of the man and respect for his personal character are the only things that preserve the appearance of its existence if government be what mr burke describes it Quote, a contrivance of human wisdom end quote. i might ask him if wisdom was at such a low ebb in england that it was become necessary to import it from holland and from hanover but i will do the country the justice to say that was not the case and even if it was it mistook the cargo 
the wisdom of every country when properly exerted is sufficient for all its purposes and there could exist no more real occasion in england to have sent for a dutch stadtholder or a german elector than there was in america to have done a similar thing if a country does not understand its own affairs how is a foreigner to understand them who knows neither its laws its manners nor its language if there existed a man so transcendently wise above all others that his wisdom was necessary to instruct a nation some reason might be offered for monarchy but when we cast our eyes about a country and observe how every part understands its own affairs and when we look around the world and see that of all men in it the race of kings are the most insignificant in capacity our reason cannot fail to ask us what are those men kept for if there is anything in monarchy which we people of america do not understand i wish mr burke would be so kind as to inform us i see in america a government extending over a country ten times as large as england and conducted with regularity for a fortieth part of the expense which government costs in england if i ask a man in america if he wants a king he retorts and asks me if i take him for an idiot how is it that this difference happens are we more or less wise than others i see in america the generality of people living in a style of plenty unknown in monarchical countries and i see that the principle of its government which is that of the equal rights of man is making a rapid progress in the world if monarchy is a useless thing why is it kept up anywhere and if a necessary thing how can it be dispensed with that civil government is necessary all civilized nations will agree but civil government is republican government all that part of the government of england which begins with the office of constable and proceeds through the department of magistrate quarter sessions and general assises including trial by jury is republican government nothing of monarchy appears in any part of it except in the name which william the conqueror imposed upon the english that of obliging them to call him their sovereign lord and king it is easy to conceive that a band of interested men such as placemen pensioners lords of the bedchamber lords of the kitchen lords of the necessary house and the lord knows what besides can find as many reasons for monarchy as their salaries paid at the expense of the country amount to but if i ask the farmer the manufacturer the merchant the tradesman and down through all the occupations of life to the common laborer what service monarchy is to him he can give me no answer if i ask him what monarchy is he believes it is something like a sinecure notwithstanding the taxes of england amount to almost seventeen millions a year said to be for the expenses of government it is still evident that the sense of the nation is left to govern itself and does govern itself by magistrates and juries almost at its own charge on republican principles exclusive of the expense of taxes the salaries of the judges are almost the only charge that is paid out of the revenue considering that all the internal government is executed by the people the taxes of england ought to be the lightest of any nation in europe instead of which they are the contrary as this cannot be accounted for on the score of civil government the subject necessarily extends itself to the monarchical part when the people of england sent for george the first and it would puzzle a wiser man than mr burke to discover for what he could be wanted or what service he could render they ought at least to have conditioned for the abandonment of hanover besides the endless german intrigues that must follow from the german elector being king of england there is a natural impossibility of uniting in the same person the principles of freedom and the principles of despotism or as it is usually called in england arbitrary power a german elector is in his electorate a despot how then could it be expected that he should be attached to principles of liberty in one country while his interest in another was to be supported by despotism the union cannot exist and it might easily have been foreseen that german electors would make german kings or in mr burke's words would assume government with contempt the english have been in the habit of considering a king of england only in the character in which he appears to them whereas the same person while the connection lasts has a home seat in another country the interest of which is different from their own and the principles of the governments in opposition to each other to such a person england will appear as a town residence and the electorate as the estate 
the english may wish as i believe they do success to the principles of liberty in france or in germany but the german elector trembles for the fate of despotism in his electorate and the duchy of mecklenburg where the present queen's family governs is under the same wretched state of arbitrary power and the people in slavish vassalage there never was a time when it became the english to watch continental intrigues more circumspectly than at the present moment and to distinguish the politics of the electorate from the politics of the nation the revolution of france has entirely changed the ground with respect to england and france as nations but the german despots with prussia at their head are combining against liberty and the fondness of mr pitt for office and the interest which all his family connections have obtained do not give sufficient security against this intrigue as everything which passes in the world becomes matter for history i will now quit this subject and take a concise review of the state of parties and politics in england as mr burke has done in france whether the present reign commenced with contempt i leave to mr burke certain however it is that it had strongly that appearance the animosity of the english nation it is very well remembered ran high and had the true principles of liberty been as well understood then as they now promised to be it is probable the nation would not have patiently submitted to so much george the first and second were sensible of a rival in the remains of the stuarts and as they could not but consider themselves as standing on their good behavior they had prudence to keep their german principles of government to themselves but as the stuart family wore away the prudence became less necessary the contest between rights and what are called prerogatives continued to heat the nation till some time after the conclusion of the american war when all at once it fell a calm execration exchanged itself for applause and court popularity sprung up like a mushroom in the night to account for this sudden transition it is proper to observe that there are two distinct species of popularity the one excited by merit the other by resentment as the nation had formed itself into two parties and each was extolling the merits of its parliamentary champions for and against prerogative nothing could operate to give a more general shock than an immediate coalition of the champions themselves the partisans of each being thus suddenly left in the lurch and mutually heated with disgust at the measure felt no other relief than uniting in a common execration against both a higher stimulus or resentment being thus excited than what the contest on prerogatives occasioned the nation quitted all former objects of rights and wrongs and sought only that of gratification the indignation at the coalition so effectually superseded the indignation against the court as to extinguish it and without any change of principles on the part of the court the same people who had reprobated its despotism united with it to revenge themselves on the coalition parliament the case was not which they liked best but which they hated most and the least hated passed for love the dissolution of the coalition parliament as it afforded the means of gratifying the resentment of the nation could not fail to be popular and from hence arose the popularity of the court transitions of this kind exhibit a nation under the government of temper instead of a fixed and steady principle and having once committed itself however rashly it feels itself urged along to justify by continuance its first proceeding measures which at other times it would censure it now approves and acts persuasion upon itself to suffocate its judgment on the return of the new parliament the new minister mr pitt found himself in a secure majority and the nation gave him credit not out of regard to himself but because it had resolved to do it out of resentment to another he introduced himself to public notice by a proposed reform of parliament which in its operation would have amounted to a public justification of corruption the nation was to be at the expense of buying up the rotten boroughs whereas it ought to punish the persons who deal in the traffic passing over the two bubbles of the dutch business and the million a year to sink the national debt the matter which most presents itself is the affair of the regency never in the course of my observation was delusion more successfully acted nor a nation more completely deceived but to make this appear it will be necessary to go over the circumstances end of part two of three of the miscellaneous chapter 
Section 21 of Rights of Man by Thomas Paine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rights of Man, Part the First, being an answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French Revolution. The Miscellaneous Chapter, Part Three of Three. Mr. Fox had stated in the House of Commons that the Prince of Wales, as heir in succession, had a right in himself to assume the government. This was opposed by Mr. Pitt, and so far as the opposition was confined to the doctrine, it was just. But the principles which Mr. Pitt maintained on the contrary side were as bad or worse in their extent than those of Mr. Fox, because they went to establish an aristocracy over the nation and over the small representation it has in the House of Commons. Whether the English form of government is good or bad is not in this case the question, but taking it as it stands, without regard to its merits or demerits, Mr. Pitt was farther from the point than Mr. Fox. It is supposed to consist of three parts while therefore the nation is disposed to continue this form the parts have a national standing independent of each other and are not the creatures of each other had mr fox passed through parliament and said that the person alluded to claimed on the ground of the nation mr pitt must have then contended what he called the right of the parliament against the right of the nation by the appearance which the contest made mr fox took the hereditary ground and Mr. Pitt the parliamentary ground, but the fact is, they both took hereditary ground, and Mr. Pitt took the worst of the two. What is called the Parliament is made up of two houses, one of which is more hereditary and more beyond the control of the nation than what the crown, as it is called, is supposed to be. It is an hereditary aristocracy, assuming and asserting indefeasible, irrevocable rights and authority, wholly independent of the nation. Where, then, was the merited popularity of exalting this hereditary power over another hereditary power less independent of the nation than what itself assumed to be, and of absorbing the rights of the nation into a house over which it has neither election nor control? the general impulse of the nation was right but it acted without reflection it approved the opposition made to the right set up by mr fox without perceiving that mr pitt was supporting another indefeasible right more remote from the nation in opposition to it with respect to the house of commons it is elected but by a small part of the nation but were the election as universal as taxation, which it ought to be, it would still only be the organ of the nation and cannot possess inherent rights. When the National Assembly of France resolves a matter, the resolve is made in right of the nation. But Mr. Pitt, on all national questions, so far as they refer to the House of Commons, absorbs the rights of the nation into the organ and makes the organ into the nation and the nation itself into a cipher. In a few words, the question on the Regency was a question of a million a year, which is appropriated to the executive department, and Mr. Pitt could not possess himself of any management of this sum without setting up the supremacy of Parliament, and when this is accomplished, it was indifferent who should be regent, as he must be regent at his own cost. Among the curiosities which this contentious debate afforded was that of making the great seal into a king, the affixing of which to an act was to be royal authority. If, therefore, royal authority is a great seal, it consequently is in itself nothing, and a good constitution would be of definitely more value to the nation than what the three nominal powers, as they now stand, are worth. The continual use of the word constitution in the English Parliament shows there is none, and that the whole is merely a form of government without a constitution, and constituting itself with what powers it pleases. If there were a constitution, it certainly could be referred to, and the debate on any constitutional point would terminate by producing the constitution. One member says this is constitution, and another says that is constitution. Today it is one thing, and tomorrow something else, while the maintaining of the debate proves there is none. Constitution is now the cant word of Parliament, tuning itself to the ear of the nation. 
formerly it was the universal supremacy of parliament the omnipotence of parliament but since the progress of liberty in france those phrases have a despotic harshness in their note and the english parliament have catched the fashion from the national assembly but without the substance of speaking of constitution as the present generation of the people in england did not make the government they are not accountable for any of its defects but that sooner or later it must come into their hands to undergo a constitutional reformation is as certain as that the same thing has happened in france if france with a revenue of nearly twenty four millions sterling with an extent of rich and fertile country above four times larger than england with a population of twenty four millions of inhabitants to support taxation with upwards of ninety millions sterling of gold and silver circulating in the nation and with a debt less than the present debt of england still found it necessary from whatever cause to come to a settlement of its affairs it solves the problem of funding for both countries to say how long what is called the english constitution has lasted and to argue from thence how long it is to last the question is how long can the funding system last it is a thing of modern invention and has not yet continued beyond the life of a man yet in that short space it has so far accumulated that together with the current expenses it requires an amount of taxes at least equal to the whole landed rental of the nation in acres to defray the annual expenditure that a government could not have always gone on by the same system which has been followed for the last seventy years must be evident to every man and for the same reason it cannot always go on the funding system is not money neither is it properly speaking credit it in effect creates upon paper the sum which it appears to borrow and lays on a tax to keep the imaginary capital alive by the payment of interest and sends the annuity to market to be sold for paper already in circulation if any credit is given it is to the disposition of the people to pay the tax and not to the government which lays it on when this disposition expires what is supposed to be the credit of the government expires with it the instance of france under the former government shows that it is impossible to compel the payment of taxes by force when a whole nation is determined to take its stand upon that ground mr burke in his review of the finances of france states the quantity of gold and silver in france at about eighty eight millions sterling in doing this he has i presume divided by the difference of exchange instead of the standard of twenty four livres to a pound sterling for m necar's statement from which mr burke's is taken is two thousand two hundred millions of livres which is upwards of ninety one millions and a half sterling m necar in france and mr george chalmers at the office of trade and plantation in england of which lord hawkesbury is president published nearly about the same time seventeen eighty six an account of the quantity of money in each nation from the returns of the mint of each nation mr chalmers from the returns of the english mint at the tower of london states the quantity of money in england including scotland and ireland to be twenty millions sterling m necar says that the amount of money in france recoined from the old coin which was called in was two thousand five hundred millions of livres upwards of one hundred and four millions sterling and after deducting for waste and what may be in the west indies and other possible circumstances states the circulation quantity at home to be ninety one millions and a half sterling but taking it as mr burke has put it it is sixty eight millions more than the national quantity in england that the quantity of money in france cannot be under this sum may at once be seen from the state of the french revenue without referring to the records of the french mint for proofs the revenue of france prior to the revolution was nearly twenty four millions sterling and as paper had then no existence in france the whole revenue was collected upon gold and silver and it would have been impossible to have collected such a quantity of revenue upon a less national quantity than m necar has stated 
before the establishment of paper in england the revenue was about a fourth part of the national amount of gold and silver as may be known by referring to the revenue prior to king william and the quantity of money stated to be in the nation at that time which was nearly as much as it is now it can be of no real service to a nation to impose upon itself or to permit itself to be imposed upon but the prejudices of some and the imposition of others have always represented france as a nation possessing but little money whereas the quantity is not only more than four times what the quantity is in england but is considerably greater on a proportion of numbers to account for this deficiency on the part of england some reference should be had to the english system of funding it operates to multiply paper and to substitute it in the room of money in various shapes and the more paper is multiplied the more opportunities are offered to export the specie and it admits of a possibility by extending it to small notes of increasing paper till there is no money left I know this is not a pleasant subject to English readers, but the matters I am going to mention are so important in themselves as to require the attention of men interested in money transactions of a public nature. There is a circumstance stated by M. Nekar in his treatise on the administration of the finances, which has never been attended to in England, but which forms the only basis whereon to estimate the quantity of money gold and silver which ought to be in every nation in europe to preserve a relative proportion with other nations lisbon and cadiz are the two ports into which money gold and silver from south america are imported and which afterwards divide and spread themselves over europe by means of commerce and increase the quantity of money in all parts of europe if therefore the amount of the annual importation into europe can be known and the relative proportion of the foreign commerce of the several nations by which it can be distributed can be ascertained they give a rule sufficiently true to ascertain the quantity of money which ought to be found in any nation at any given time mr Nekar shows from the registers of lisbon and cadiz that the importation of gold and silver into europe is five millions sterling annually he has not taken it on a single year but on an average of fifteen succeeding years from seventeen sixty three to seventeen seventy seven both inclusive in which time the amount was one thousand eight hundred million livres which is seventy five millions sterling from the commencement of the hanover succession in seventeen fourteen to the time mr chalmers published is seventy-two years and the quantity imported into europe in that time would be three hundred and sixty millions sterling if the foreign commerce of great britain be stated as a sixth part of what the whole foreign commerce of europe amounts to which is probably an inferior estimation to what the gentlemen at the exchange would allow the proportion which britain should draw by commerce of this sum to keep herself on a proportion with the rest of europe would be also a sixth part which is sixty millions sterling and if the same allowance for waste and accident be made for england which m necar makes for france the quantity remaining after these deductions would be fifty two millions and this sum ought to have been in the nation at the time mr chalmers published in addition to the sum which was in the nation at the commencement of the hanover succession and to have made in the whole at least sixty six millions sterling instead of which there were but twenty millions which is forty six millions below its proportionate quantity as the quantity of gold and silver imported into lisbon and cadiz is more exactly ascertained than that of any commodity imported into england and as the quantity of money coined at the tower of london is still more positively known the leading facts do not admit of controversy either therefore the commerce of england is unproductive of profit or the gold and silver which it brings in leak continually away by unseen means at an average rate of about three-quarters of a million a year which in the course of seventy-two years accounts for the deficiency and its absence is supplied by paper footnote whether the english commerce does not bring in money or whether the government sends it out after it is brought in is a matter which the parties concerned can best explain 
but that the deficiency exists is not in the power of either to disprove while dr price mr eden now auckland mr chalmers and others were debating whether the quantity of money in england was greater or less than at the revolution the circumstance was not averted to that since the revolution there cannot be less than four hundred millions sterling imported into europe and therefore the quantity in england ought at least to have been four times greater than it was at the revolution to be on a proportion with europe what england is now doing by paper is what she would have been able to do by solid money if gold and silver had come into the nation in the proportion it ought or had not been sent out and she is endeavoring to restore by paper the balance she has lost by money it is certain that the gold and silver which arrive annually in the register ships to spain and portugal do not remain in those countries taking the value half in gold and half in silver it is about four hundred tons annually and from the number of ships and galleons employed in the trade of bringing those metals from south america to portugal and spain the quantity sufficiently proves itself without referring to the registers in the situation england now is it is impossible she can increase in money high taxes not only lessen the property of the individuals but they lessen also the money capital of the nation by inducing smuggling which can only be carried on by gold and silver by the politics which the british government have carried on with the inland powers of germany and the continent it is made an enemy of all the maritime powers and is therefore obliged to keep up a large navy but though the navy is built in england the naval stores must be purchased from abroad and that from countries where the greatest part must be paid for in gold and silver some fallacious rumors have been set afloat in england to induce a belief in money and among others that of the french refugees bringing great quantities the idea is ridiculous the general part of the money in france is silver and it would take upwards of twenty of the largest broad wheel wagons with ten horses each to remove one million sterling of silver is it then to be supposed that a few people fleeing on horseback or in post chaises in a secret manner and having the french custom house to pass and the sea to cross could bring even a sufficiency for their own expenses where millions of money are spoken of it should be recollected that such sums can only accumulate in a country by slow degrees and a long procession of time the most frugal system that england could now adopt would not recover in a century the balance she has lost in money since the commencement of the hanover succession she is seventy millions behind france and she must be in some considerable proportion behind every country in europe because the returns of the english mint do not show an increase of money while the registers of lisbon and cadiz show an european increase of between three and four hundred millions sterling and footnote the revolution of france is attended with many novel circumstances not only in the political sphere but in the circle of money transactions among others it shows that a government may be in a state of insolvency and a nation rich so far as the fact is confined to the late government of france it was insolvent because the nation would no longer support its extravagance and therefore it could no longer support itself but with respect to the nation all the means existed a government may be said to be insolvent every time it applies to the nation to discharge its arrears the insolvency of the late government of france and the present of england differed in no other respect than as the dispositions of the people differ the people of france refuse their aid to the old government and the people of england submit to taxation without inquiry what is called the crown in england has been insolvent several times the last of which publicly known was in may seventeen seventy seven when it applied to the nation to discharge upwards of six hundred thousand pounds private debts which otherwise it could not pay it was the error of mr pitt mr burke and all those who were unacquainted with the affairs of france to confound the french nation with the french government the french nation in effect endeavored to render the late government insolvent for the purpose of taking government into its own hands and it reserved its means for the support of the new government 
in a country of such vast extent and population as france the natural means cannot be wanting and the political means appear the instant the nation is disposed to permit them when mr burke in a speech last winter in the british parliament quote, cast his eyes over the map of europe and saw a chasm that once was france End quote. he talked like a dreamer of dreams the same natural france existed as before and all the natural means existed with it the only chasm was that which the extinction of despotism had left and which was to be filled up with the constitution more formidable in resources than the power which had expired although the french nation rendered the late government insolvent it did not permit the insolvency to act toward the creditors and the creditors considering the nation as the real paymaster and the government only as the agent rested themselves on the nation in preference to the government this appears greatly to disturb mr burke as the precedent is fatal to the policy by which governments have supposed themselves secure they have contracted debts with a view of attaching what is called the moneyed interest of the nation to their support but the example in france shows that the permanent security of the creditor is in the nation and not in the government and that in all possible revolutions that may happen in governments the means are always with the nation and the nation always in existence mr burke argues that the creditors ought to have abided the fate of the government which they trusted but the national assembly considered them as the creditors of the nation and not of the government of the master and not of the steward notwithstanding the late government could not discharge the current expenses the present government has paid off a great part of the capital this has been accomplished by two means the one by lessening the expenses of government and the other by the sale of the monastic and ecclesiastical landed estates the devotees and penitent debauchees extortioners and misers of former days to ensure themselves a better world than that they were about to leave had bequeathed immense property in trust to the priesthood for pious uses and the priesthood kept it for themselves the national assembly has ordered it to be sold for the good of the whole nation and the priesthood to be decently provided for in consequence of the revolution the annual interest of the debt of france will be reduced at least six millions sterling by paying off upwards of one hundred millions of the capital which with lessening the former expenses of government at least three millions will place france in a situation worthy the imitation of europe upon a whole review of the subject how vast is the contrast while mr burke has been talking of a general bankruptcy in france the national assembly has been paying off the capital of its debt and while taxes have increased near a million a year in england they have lowered several millions a year in france not a word has either mr burke or mr pitt said about the french affairs or the state of the french finances in the present session of parliament the subject begins to be too well understood and imposition serves no longer there is a general enigma running through the whole of mr burke's book he writes in a rage against the national assembly but what is he enraged about if his assertions were as true as they are groundless and that france by her revolution has annihilated her power and become what he calls a chasm it might excite the grief of a frenchman considering himself as a national man and provoke his rage against the national assembly but why should it excite the rage of mr burke alas it is not the nation of france that mr burke means but the court and every court in europe dreading the same fate is in mourning he writes neither in the character of a frenchman nor of an englishman but in the fawning character of that creature known in all countries and a friend to none a courtier whether it be the court of versailles or the court of st james or carlton house or the court in expectation signifies not for the caterpillar principle of all courts and courtiers are alike they form a common policy throughout europe detached and separate from the interest of the nations and while they appear to quarrel they agree to plunder nothing can be more terrible to a court or courtier than the revolution of france that which is a blessing to nations is bitterness to them and as their existence depends on the duplicity of a country they tremble at the approach of principles and dread the precedent that threatens their overthrow End of the miscellaneous chapter.
Section 22 of Rights of Man by Thomas Paine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rights of Man, Part the First, being an answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French Revolution. Conclusion Reason and ignorance, the opposites of each other, influence the great bulk of mankind. If either of these can be rendered sufficiently extensive in a country, the machinery of government goes easily on. Reason obeys itself, and ignorance submits to whatever is dictated to it. The two modes of the government which prevail in the world are, first, government by election and representation, secondly, government by hereditary succession. The former is generally known by the name of republic, the latter by that of monarchy and aristocracy. Those two distinct and opposite forms erect themselves on the two distinct and opposite bases of reason and ignorance, as the exercise of government requires talents and abilities, and as talents and abilities cannot have hereditary descent, it is evident that hereditary succession requires a belief from man to which his reason cannot subscribe, and which can only be established upon his ignorance, and the more ignorant any country is, the better it is fitted for this species of government. On the contrary, government, in a well-constituted republic, requires no belief from man beyond what his reason can give. He sees the rationale of the whole system, its origin and its operation, and as it is best supported when best understood, the human faculties act with boldness and acquire under this form of government a gigantic manliness. As, therefore, each of these forms acts on a different base, the one moving freely by the aid of reason, the other by ignorance, we have next to consider what is it that gives motion to that species of government which is called mixed government, or as it is sometimes ludicrously styled, a government of this, that, and t'other. The moving power in this species of government is, of necessity, corruption. However imperfect election and representation may be in mixed governments, they still give exercise to a greater portion of reason than is convenient to the hereditary part, and therefore it becomes necessary to buy the reason up. A mixed government is an imperfect everything, cementing and soldering the discordant parts together by corruption to act as a whole. Mr. Burke appears highly disgusted that France, since she has resolved on a revolution, did not adopt what he calls, quote, a British constitution, end quote. And the regretful manner in which he expresses himself on this occasion implies a suspicion that the British constitution needed something to keep its defects in countenance. In mixed governments, there is no responsibility, the parts cover each other till responsibility is lost, and the corruption which moves the machine contrives at the same time its own escape. When it is laid down as a maxim that a king can do no wrong, it places him in a state of similar security with that of idiots and persons insane, and responsibility is out of the question with respect to himself. It then descends upon the minister, who shelters himself under a majority in Parliament, which by places, pensions, and corruption he can always command, and that majority justifies itself by the same authority with which it protects the minister. In this rotatory motion, responsibility is thrown off from the parts and from the whole. When there is a part in the government which can do no wrong, it implies that it does nothing and is only the machine of another power by whose advice and direction it acts. What is supposed to be the king in the mixed governments is the cabinet, and as the cabinet is always a part of the parliament and the members justifying in one character what they advise and act in another, a mixed government becomes a continual enigma entailing upon a country by the quantity of corruption necessary to solder the parts the expense of supporting all the forms of government at once and finally resolving itself into a government by committee in which the advisers the actors the approvers the justifiers the persons responsible and the persons not responsible are the same persons by this pantomimical contrivance and change of scene and character, the parts help each other out in matters which neither of them singly would assume to act. 
when money is to be obtained the mass of variety apparently dissolves and a profusion of parliamentary praises passes between the parts each admires with astonishment the wisdom the liberality the disinterestedness of the other and all of them breathe a pitying sigh at the burthens of the nation but in a well-constituted republic nothing of this soldering praising and pitying can take place the representation being equal throughout the country and complete in itself however it may be arranged into legislative and executive they have all one and the same natural source the parts are not foreigners to each other like democracy aristocracy and monarchy as there are no discordant distinctions there is nothing to corrupt by compromise nor confound by contrivance public measures appeal of themselves to the understanding of the nation and resting on their own merits disown any flattering applications to vanity the continual whine of lamenting the burden of taxes however successfully it may be practiced in mixed governments is inconsistent with the sense and spirit of a republic if taxes are necessary they are of course advantageous but if they require an apology the apology itself implies an impeachment why then is man thus imposed upon or why does he impose upon himself when men are spoken of as kings and subjects or when government is mentioned under the distinct and combined heads of monarchy aristocracy and democracy what is it that reasoning man is to understand by the terms if there really existed in the world two or more distinct and separate elements of human power we should then see the several origins to which those terms would descriptively apply but as there is but one species of man there can be but one element of human power and that element is man himself monarchy aristocracy and democracy are but creatures of imagination and a thousand such may be contrived as well as three from the revolutions of america and france and the symptoms that have appeared in other countries it is evident that the opinion of the world is changing with respect to systems of government and that revolutions are not within the compass of political calculations the progress of time and circumstances which men assign to the accomplishment of great changes is too mechanical to measure the force of the mind and the rapidity of reflection by which revolutions are generated all the old governments have received a shock from those that already appear and which were once more improbable and are a greater subject of wonder than a general revolution in europe would be now when we survey the wretched condition of man under the monarchical and hereditary systems of government dragged from his home by one power or driven by another and impoverished by taxes more than by enemies it becomes evident that those systems are bad and that a general revolution in the principle and construction of governments is necessary what is government more than the management of the affairs of a nation it is not and from its nature cannot be the property of any particular man or family but of the whole community at whose expense it is supported and though by force and contrivance it has been usurped into an inheritance the usurpation cannot alter the right of things sovereignty as a matter of right appertains to the nation only and not to any individual and a nation has at all times an inherent indefeasible right to abolish any form of government it finds inconvenient and to establish such as accords with its interest disposition and happiness the romantic and barbarous distinction of men into kings and subjects though it may suit the condition of the courtiers cannot that of citizens and is exploded by the principle upon which governments are now founded every citizen is a member of the sovereignty and as such can acknowledge no personal subjection and his obedience can be only to the laws when men think of what government is they must necessarily suppose it to possess a knowledge of all the objects and matters upon which its authority is to be exercised in this view of government the republican system as established by america and france operates to embrace the whole of a nation and the knowledge necessary to the interest of all the parts is to be found in the center which the parts by representation form but the old governments are on the construction that excludes knowledge as well as happiness governments by monks who knew nothing of the world beyond the walls of a convent 
is as consistent as government by kings what were formerly called revolutions were little more than a change of persons or an alteration of local circumstances they rose and fell like things of course and had nothing in their existence or their fate that could influence beyond the spot that produced them but what we now see in the world from the revolutions of america and france are a renovation of the natural order of things a system of principles as universal as truth and the existence of man and combining moral with political happiness and national prosperity one men are born and always continue free and equal in respect of their rights civil distinctions therefore can be founded only on public utility two the end of all political associations is the preservation of the natural and imprescriptible rights of man and these rights are liberty property security and resistance of oppression three the nation is essentially the source of all sovereignty nor can any individual or any body of men be entitled to any authority which is not expressly derived from it in these principles there is nothing to throw a nation into confusion by inflaming ambition they are calculated to call forth wisdom and abilities and to exercise them for the public good and not for the emolument or aggrandizement of particular descriptions of men or of families monarchical sovereignty the enemy of mankind and the source of misery is abolished and the sovereignty itself is restored to its natural and original place the nation were this the case throughout europe the cause of wars would be taken away it is attributed to henry the fourth of france a man of enlarged and benevolent heart that he proposed about the year sixteen ten a plan for abolishing war in europe the plan consisted in constituting a european congress or as the french authors style it a pacific republic by appointing delegates from the several nations who were to act as a court of arbitration in any disputes that might arise between nation and nation had such a plan been adopted at the time it was proposed the taxes of england and france as two of the parties would have been at least ten millions sterling annually to each nation less than they were at the commencement of the french revolution to conceive a cause why such a plan has not been adopted and that instead of a congress for the purpose of preventing war it has been called only to terminate a war after a fruitless expense of several years it will be necessary to consider the interest of governments as a distinct interest to that of nations whatever is the cause of taxes to a nation becomes also the means of revenue to government every war terminates with an addition of taxes and consequently with an addition of revenue and in any event of war in the manner they are now commenced and concluded the power and interest of governments are increased war therefore from its productiveness as it easily furnishes the pretense of necessity for taxes and appointments to places and offices becomes a principal part of the system of old governments and to establish any mode to abolish war however advantageous it might be to nations would be to take from such governments the most lucrative of its branches the frivolous matters upon which war is made show the disposition and avidity of governments to uphold the system of war and betray the motives upon which they act why are not republics plunged into war but because the nature of their government does not admit of an interest distinct from that of the nation even holland though an ill-constructed republic and with a commerce extending over the world existed nearly a century without war and the instant the form of government was changed in france the republican principles of peace and domestic prosperity and economy arose with the new government and the same consequences would follow the cause in other nations as war is the system of government on the old construction the animosity which nations reciprocally entertain is nothing more than what the policy of their governments excites to keep up the spirit of the system each government accuses the other of perfidy intrigue and ambition as a means of heating the imagination of their respective nations and incensing them to hostilities man is not the enemy of man but through the medium of a false system of government 
instead therefore of exclaiming against the ambition of kings the exclamation should be directed against the principles of such governments and instead of seeking to reform the individual the wisdom of a nation should apply itself to reform the system whether the forms and maxims of governments which are still in practice were adapted to the condition of the world at the period they were established is not in this case the question the older they are the less correspondence can they have with the present state of things time and change of circumstances and opinions have the same progressive effect in rendering modes of government obsolete as they have upon customs and manners agriculture commerce manufactures and the tranquil arts by which the prosperity of nations is best promoted require a different system of government and a different species of knowledge to direct its operations than which might have been required in the former condition of the world as it is not difficult to perceive from the enlightened state of mankind that hereditary governments are verging to their decline and that revolutions on the broad basis of national sovereignty and government by representation are making their way in europe it would be an act of wisdom to anticipate their approach and produce revolutions by reason and accommodation rather than commit them to the issue of convulsions from what we now see nothing of reform in the political world ought to be held improbable it is an age of revolutions in which everything may be looked for the intrigue of courts by which the system of war is kept up may provoke a confederation of nations to abolish it and a european congress to patronize the progress of free government and promote the civilization of nations with each other is an event nearer in probability than once were the revolutions and alliance of france and america we have arrived at the end of part one of the rights of man